Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course. Go to safeddeen.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Crowd Health. Crowd Health is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to this show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. Crowd Health is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. Crowd Health holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin, it negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf, and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. This podcast is also brought to you by the Bitcoin way, your professional Bitcoin IT team offering you personalized, secure and comprehensive solutions for every step along your Bitcoin journey. The Bitcoin way offer live concierge service to guide you with your Bitcoin cold storage, running your node, privacy best practices, inheritance planning, corporate strategy and multi-sig solutions. They don't touch your coins, they guide you through the process of acquiring your coins and securing them. If you'd like to make your setup safer and more reliable, book a consult with them and see what they have to suggest. If you want to give someone the gift of Bitcoin, get them this professional service that will ensure they start off knowing exactly how to manage their coins and not lose them. Go to thebitcoinway.com and start Bitcoining more confidently. Seyfedin Amous, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thank you for having me, Robert, and thank you for uh, tackling this very thorny topic. Yes, thorny, thorny it is. Um, it's great to have you on. I think this is the first time I've had you on, um, and it is a thorny topic, but one that is very important that we discuss. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, not that you need one, you are the author of the Bitcoin Standard, Fiat Standard, and most recently, Principles of Economics. Um, very well-known, probably the best-known author in the Bitcoin space. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about the history, I guess, of Israel and Palestine. So, um, yeah, as I was telling you offline, uh, this has been another one of, of those situations, I think, where as I've started to look into the history a little bit more, I've started to realize that I have basically been a victim of Western propagandizing, Western programming, something like that. Um, the general notion for me growing up in Tennessee was that there's been war in the Middle East forever and it's probably going to go on forever and it's rooted somehow in like an irreconcilable religious dispute. And it's not something I ever paid a lot of mind, uh, not something we're taught a lot about. And then obviously recent events have, have caused me to take a closer look. Um, and I would also credit my girlfriend a lot. She has pushed me to look into this more closely. Um, 
And so there's this weird notion, I think, where almost like a joke where someone might say something to the effect like, oh, you know, that guy has an ice cubes chance in hell of getting this job. You know, like there's a very low probability of success, basically. And I've heard a similar notion used in regard to the quote unquote war in the Middle East. Like, oh, you know, this will happen. There will be peace in the Middle East before this thing will happen. Something like that. And so there's this idea, I guess, conditioned or propagandized into us, some of us, um, that this is a centuries plus old conflict. Um, but it, I think that's a little bit far from the truth. So I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a very uh, big misconception and it's, um, it, it plays into the propagation of the conflict as this, uh, interminable, intractable thing that is going to have to continue forever because it presents it as if it is just destined, as if it's just this uh, eternal struggle between religions. And I don't think it is accurate. Uh, if you look at the highlights reel of conflicts of the last 2000 years, then yeah, it looks like it's all conflict, but that was not the case. So to try and give a little bit of a uh, brief historical overview of the last 2000 years before we got here, it's actually not that difficult to do it. I mean, obviously I am going to be summarizing extensively, but it isn't as if it was all bloody conflict. So 400 years before um, the 20th century was almost entirely peaceful in Palestine. Uh, if you go back, say to the Romans, the Romans came and they crushed the Jewish revolt around um, the time of Christ. And after that, the Jewish people were um, sent into diaspora under the Romans. And after that, the Romans captured Jerusalem. And during that period, they prevented the Jews from going back to Jerusalem. And so for about 500 years, 600 years or so, Jews could not go to Jerusalem and it was only Christians there. Now, what happened then was in the year 637, Muslims uh, uh, defeated the Romans and took control of uh, Jerusalem. And the first thing that they did, it was the Caliph Omar, who was one of the uh, close trusted associates of Prophet Muhammad. And he was the second Caliph in Islam. And he was the one who captured Jerusalem. And one of the first thing that he did was that he let the Jews go back to Jerusalem and he cleaned up the temple because the Romans had turned the temple into the trash dump of Jerusalem deliberately so that they could uh, you know, avenge what the Jews had done in terms of the revolt. So for 500 years, Jews could not go back to Jerusalem. And the furthest, they, the closest they could come was Gaza in the south and uh, uh, Bisan in the north, where they would come from, say, Europe or from the east or the west. And they would only get there and face the temple in Jerusalem and pray towards it. When Muslims caught it, when Muslims captured it, they understood that this was important for the Jews and it was also important for Muslims. It also has uh, religious significance for Muslims. And so they built a mosque there and they brought the Jews and allowed the Jews to go back and pray there. And they also allowed the Christians to remain there. So one very important thing is that people just think, well, Historically, you usually get this particularly from Americans, which is, well, people have been fighting and, you know, the Muslims got it for a while. Now it's the Jews' time and uh, it's just how it is. But there's something very distinct and different about what is going on now. When the Muslims caught it and when many other people came and conquered the land, so from 637 up until the 20th century, it was always the rulers that changed. So the Muslims came in, they kicked out the Roman rulers of the land but they did not kick out the local population. The local population at that time was Christian. They let them stay Christian. They did not bring in Arabs from uh, the Arab Peninsula to displace the Palestinian local population. And this is a misconception most people have. They think the Arabs came and kicked out the local population, which was Jewish and Christian. No, the Jews were kicked out by the Romans. They were brought back by the Muslims and the Christians were allowed to remain. And some Arabs migrated and lived there, but the local population, this is what genetic studies show, the local population was largely intact. And so the Palestinians who live in Palestine today, people like me, 
you look at genetic studies, I haven't done my own, but uh, most of the Palestinians who have done it, you see that they go back to the original population, which was Canaanite, and uh, some of them were Hebrew, some of them were from the tribes of Israel, but mainly it was, I mean, uh, these are parts of the Canaanite population. So it's the Canaanite population that was there for thousands of years, has mostly remained intact, and then with the Arab uh, uh, conquering of Palestine, you get an introduction of some Arabic genes, and then through time you get an introduction of some African genes and some European genes, but you still have the very distinct genetic makeup of the original population that's still there. And so for 2,000 years, or for, I should say, 1,400 years, you had this coexistence of Muslims, Jews, and Christians on the land under different Muslim uh, rulerships. So different uh, Islamic states would come and conquer the land, but most of the time the local population remained the same and Jews remained in that land and there was practically no conflict, uh, no major conflict, I should say, between uh, 600 AD to about 1948 or the 20th century between Muslims and Jews or Muslims and Christians. Uh, a lot of people converted to Islam so that by the 20th century, the majority of the population was Muslim, but you could still be Christian and you could still be Jewish. And I think uh, for our purposes, the way that I like to think of the world, the most important thing to understand here is the issue of property rights. And Jews, Muslims, and Christians could have property rights in this land up until then. So this notion that it was an intractable religious conflict of the cat and mouse fighting each other and one day this guy has the this group has the upper hand and then it oppresses the rest and then the other the next day the other group has it it's not really accurate the last time you had this kind of religious conflict where a group gets eradicated or gets kicked out uh, from the conflict was the romans 2000 ad and since the arabs came uh, they ruled the land they kicked out the romans they allowed the jews to live in the land and you had a coexistence between the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians, and it was possible for Jews to return. And this is, I think, another important thing. It was possible for Jews to return to Palestine throughout that period, but there was no political movement for their return until the late 19th century, inspired by the rise of European religious ethno-nationalist movements in the late 19th and early 20th century, which you know led to the rise of Nazism and fascism. It's it's from that ferment that you get the ideas for political Zionism. Mm -hmm. And here, this is the ironic thing that uh, Europeans and Americans think, well, people in the Middle East are always killing each other. Uh, it's really not been the case for thousands of years. It's really been the case since the Europeans brought in their crazy criminal notions of nationalism, ethno-nationalism, which caused hundreds of years of war in Europe. And then when they came to the Middle East, that's what has happened. It's been a hundred years of conflict since then because of this. But before that, the notion that this was interminable conflict, I think, is completely inaccurate. So long period of peace. You were saying the four hundred years, I think, before the twentieth century were basically peaceful. Yeah, it was the Ottomans, and at that point, you didn't really have any kind of uh, political changes in who ruled and who conquered the land. Yeah, and in preparation for this, I was listening to your podcast episode number 198. Um, you had, uh, I forgot his first name, last name, Hammond on. Yeah, Jeremy Hammond, yeah. Jeremy Hammond. And uh, I think he was saying as well that when the Jews, Muslims, and Christians were all living together, they were also... Uh, the, the the legal practices were be, uh, each according to their own sort of religion, right? So they all had private property rights. They all even had their own sort of court systems, I guess, that they were accustomed to at that time. And people yeah. were living together peaceably. Yes. This is, uh, the Ottoman Empire gets a bad reputation. Uh, people think it was terrible. And of course, there were terrible things about it. It mm -hmm. was, um, uh, it, it didn't do a great job in uh, spreading knowledge and education. That was the main mm -hmm. one. They uh, were very slow on the uptake of the printing press, and that was a huge historical mistake, sort of like not adopting Bitcoin today mm -hmm. and banning Bitcoin today. Mm -hmm. But to their credit, they, when they conquered a land, they let the local population live according to their own rules and laws. So when they ruled in Palestine, uh, Christians, various denominations of Christians, they had their own 
religious court system. And so in all uh, re- personal and religious matters, things were settled between people of the same religion according to the local court system. So mm-hmm. as long as you just paid your taxes to the Ottomans, mm-hmm. they let you have your own thing. Yeah. So whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, different sects across all of these religions, they all could have their own communities and they all had to, um, and they all had the privilege of uh, running things the way they wanted. So mm. Muslims lived according to Islamic law and Christians lived according to Christian law. And in the cities, you had more of an urban, um, secular, uh, particularly toward the later stages, you had more of a secular outlook on life among these uh, c- cities. Uh, but there was no uh, massive pressure for people to convert and there was mm-hmm. no massive pressure for people to leave or be kicked out because of their religion. So mm. you you have a continuous Jewish presence in Palestine from 637 until today, uninterrupted. At no point did the Muslims say, um, did any of the Muslim leaders say, we, we're, we're going to expel all the Jews from this land. Mm. Yeah, that that um, reminds me of uh, the book I read, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. I think he was one of the the originators of that model. Basically, like he would conquer a land, but he would leave them to their own devices as long as they paid the tax. Um, I, I guess perhaps the Ottoman Empire uh, adopted that approach as well. I think it's another just interesting side note. That's sort of a good case of money being superordinate to law again. It's like if you just pay the tax, you kind of have whatever legal system you want, property rights uh, as you see fit. But this all changes, I guess, in 1948. Um, and before, I guess, we go into that, which is, uh, this starts with the Balfour Declaration, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, if I'm off on years, let me know. What, what came up for me as you were saying that is I was reminded of that Ron Paul quote that the century of total war and the century of central banking were the same century and it wasn't a coincidence. Was this 1948 change, did it have something to do with the century of central banking as well? Yes, I believe that is the case. And I mean, if you know me, you know that uh, you could parody me by saying everything I hate is caused by fiat and everything I like. Is uh, and and is fixed by Bitcoin, but just because you could parody it, that doesn't mean it's not true. So, um, in fact, this does have its roots in the birth of fiat, and this is something that I uh, uh, discuss in the fiat standard in the first couple of chapters of the fiat standard. I look at the birth of fiat and how fiat came about, and uh, it happened in World War One when Britain was fighting World War One and they were trying to uh, maintain their war effort the way that they maintained the war effort at that point, and it wasn't just the British, it was all European countries at that point, they had, the technology had arrived at a point where money was becoming more and more centralized. Gold had to be centralized, as I discussed in the fiat standard, because gold is not digital, you can't send it with a button. And so in order for it to move, as the world became more advanced in the 19th century in terms of telecommunication and in terms of transportation, we developed train networks, telegraphs, telegrams, And so information and goods could move a lot faster than you could move gold around or a lot more faster than you could economically move gold around. And so the natural solution for that is to centralize uh, gold reserves. And then instead of moving the physical gold between uh, parties, you move claims on the gold sitting in the bank within a country or within a city, and then central banks settle with one another. So that causes the centralization of money in the hands of central banks. And then these central banks were able to print credit money, uh, print paper money that was essentially credit for the money that they, for the gold that they had in their vaults. And then when World War I breaks out, the difference between it and the previous wars is because of this fact, because of the majority of money being held in vaults, central banks could print more and more money to finance the war effort. And that allowed the war to continue. So famously, uh, everybody knows, well, not everybody, but a lot of people know this, that the First World War was billed as the August Bank Holiday War, that it was just going to be a few weeks, a few months, we're going to win. Everybody had the same kind of triumphalist idea of the war being just a few weeks or uh, a, a brief battle that their country is going to win. And yet it dragged on for five years. And if you think 
about what was it that the war was fought about, I think the most remarkable thing about it is that there's no clear answer for it. This is the war that derailed Western civilization. It's the war that has arguably continued until today. I mean, if you look at any conflict in the world today, you could see its roots in World War I. And yet, it's not very clear why that war happened and why people fought it and how it was resolved. So it isn't as if the British won the war by conquering Europe or conquering Germany and gaining that territory. They didn't raise the British flag in Berlin and teach the German people English or kill all the German people and conquer all of uh, Berlin. In fact, the changes in borders that happened across Europe weren't very significant. So Germany lost some land, Austria was split up, but there wasn't that much of a drastic change. And it wasn't, it, it, for the winners even, it was not worth all the uh, money and uh, lives that were expended for this. And particularly for the British who have no real geos in whatever happens in the continent because their economic interests lay in the colonies. And so they had no reason to get into this war. And it was not very well um, understood until today why they got in. And then I started digging into it. And it's really fascinating because we find that the villain in this is our old caricature villain that we like to blame everything on, John Maynard Keynes. Because in World War I, the British, they... Um, you know, they did what they used to do back then at the gold standard, if you wanted to finance a war, you'd issue bonds. So you'd issue bonds, people would buy the bonds, the bond uh, revenues would be used to finance the war effort, and then you'd pay back the bondholders. To their credit, the great people of Great Britain did not buy the, the bonds of World War One. They did not see this as a good business idea. Why should we invest in the murder of European armies fighting each other? And so less than a third of the bonds issuance that was needed to finance the war was sold. Two thirds of the bonds were not sold. So what happens? Well, the Treasury and the Bank of England get together and they decide that they're going to have two thirds of the bonds sale financed by the Bank of England surreptitiously. They got two individuals from the Bank of England to buy two thirds of the bonds under their own name at, but of course, it was financed by a line of credit from the Bank of England. So two high-ranking officials in the Bank of England, and this was all done in secret and was only revealed in 2017. A hundred years later, the, the Financial Times um, wrote, an, uh, wrote a correction about this because they were you know, they, they are the fiat shitcoin um, blog, basically, that promotes the fiat shitcoin. You can think of them as the influencers for uh, shitcoins like uh, we see in the shitcoin space. So they published an article saying, bond issuance highly successful. The, the people of Britain are eager to fund this war. We are going to win. It was triumphalist uh, war propaganda saying that the war, that the bond issue was successful. 100 years later, people digging into the archives of the Bank of England figure out that, well, actually, no, it was the Bank of England that monetized this. And so this was very early version of quantitative easing. The Bank of England effectively created new money in order to finance the war effort. And this wasn't very common at that time. And that's how they got into the war. And so, of course, that creates pressure on the value of the pound because you've created a lot more pounds and you had the pound at that point was redeemable for gold. So then the next logical step is that you need to stop the redeemability of um, pounds in gold. And that's indeed what they did in 1915. And this is what I begin the fiat standard with. So they stopped people from being able to redeem their gold in paper. And they said it's because of the war effort. And then they told the post offices and the banks to take payment in gold, but make payment only in paper. So effectively, they ended up rounding up all the gold that by the end of the war, there was very little gold held in the hands of British people. And all of the gold had gone to the central bank. And the central bank had used that gold to finance the war effort, and it sent it to the U.S. because the U.S. was the main creditor. So the U.S. so so Britain then gets dragged into this war. It was perfect example of Keynesian high time preference thinking that hey, you know, we'll just print this money right now, we'll get into the war, and then 
miracle happens and uh, we win and somehow we managed to find a way to um, pay everybody back and it all works out. But of course, miracles don't happen. Problems multiply, intensify. Lies lead to more lies and lead to more broken promises. So you suspend the redeemability and then the British find themselves in about 1917, 1916 in a very precarious position in a war where the war is dragging on and their finances are being hurt and the gold is running out. So they need the Americans to join the war effort. And in order to get the Americans to join the war effort, they strike a deal with the Zionist movement who use their influence in the US to try and convince the US to get into the war. And in return, they give them Palestine. And that's where the Balfour Declaration comes from. And that's why it's such a fiat thing because you have the foreign minister of Britain in Britain saying, writing a letter to the Rothschild family, to the um, uh, to the head of the Rothschild family, Lord Rothschild, and saying, hey, the British government views with um, sympathy the aspirations of the Zionist movement for establishing a Jewish home in Palestine. And with that, the Zionist movement works on bringing in the US into the war. And then when the US comes into the war, that effectively bails out Britain allows Britain to win the war because the US was at that point, after all of these European countries had destroyed their economies fighting each other, the US was the richest and um, strongest military left because everybody had spent three years already fighting each other. So the US was coming on uh, like the fresh substitute in a football game, mm -hmm. full of energy, able to um, enter the game and really make the difference. So the US enters the war, Britain wins. Of course, this is not the end of the economic problems. And, and in the fiat standard, I focus on the economics of how this then led to inflation in Britain and then how Britain tried to go back on the gold standard. That didn't work. So then then had to go off the gold standard and then come back. It's a very long um, discussion, which I don't really have time to get into right now, but I highly recommend reading the fiat standard if you want to get into it. Or also reading uh, Rothbard's America's Great Depression, because this is what sowed the seeds for the Great Depression. This is how the 1929 crash happened more or less very brief summary because britain couldn't go back on the gold standard they uh they were losing all of the gold and so they uh, pressured the us again to engage in inflation in order to bail them out and when the us did that that led to the 1929 bubble and uh, to the 1920s bubble and then the 1929 crash and then the great depression so um this is this is why a lot of there's a lot of anti-British sentiment in America. There was no reason for the U.S. to get into World War One. There was no reason for the U.S. to inflate in the 1920s and destroy their gold standard and create the depression. And this is where Palestinians and Americans have this in common. It was also there was no reason for any of this to happen, and there was no reason for Palestinians to have their homeland being gifted to a people that were in Europe at that and at that time. The Zionist movement was a slightly fringe movement of mainly socialist Eastern Europeans who were running away from Eastern Europe and running away from uh, persecution in Eastern Europe, particularly uh, socialist uh, Jews from Eastern Europe and rich Jews from Western Europe. So the Rothschild family and these kind of uh, um, well-to-do interests. And that was the combination. It wasn't a very popular movement among Jews. In fact, when the first Zionist Congress was held, uh, Theodore Herzl tried to hold the first Zionist Congress in Munich and he got kicked out of Munich by the Jewish community. They refused to let him hold the conference there because they were against it. And there were condemnations of the Zionist movement when it had its first Congress come out from Jewish communities all over the world. And the reason they opposed it so heavily was a, because it seemed hugely immoral that you would take the land of uh, people that were already in Palestine to give it to one group of people spread out all over the world. B, because for most people, Judaism is a religion and it's a spiritual thing. It's not a national thing. And three, perhaps more importantly and most pressingly, this would undermine the status of Jews all over the world. So if you are a German Jew or British Jew or an American Jew and you're being told there's a nation for Jews, well, then what are you doing in America? This is giving 
power and um, lending credence to all of the worst sentiments of anti-Semites in all of those places. Because if you're a German or British or American or Spanish or French anti-Semite, you don't want Jews, you don't like Jews in your country. And now they're getting this their own country, so why do you why do we need the Jews here? Let's kick them out, let's have them go there. And that was what these Europeans feared, uh, not just Europeans, Americans as well. That's what many of them feared, and that's why they opposed the Zionist movement. But uh, this is, uh, so in a sense, the, the Jews were against it, but the people who really supported it, and Herzl understood this, he said, uh, well, yeah, many people would ask him, well, what what's going to make the Jews of Vienna and all these beautiful European cities want to go to desolate Palestine? Um, why would they leave? And he said, leave it to the anti-Semites. They're going to do our recruitment for us. And he was right. Mm. And in fact, that was the motivation. That was another motivation for the British. So on the one hand, they wanted to win the Zionist movement over. But on another hand, they also were worried about all of those uh, Jews who were being expelled from Eastern Europe coming into Britain. So Lord Balfour, he was a raging anti-Semite himself. And for him, Zionism was the solution to the Jewish problem. We don't want all of those Jews to migrate to Britain. So if we give them a homeland in Palestine, we can export our Jewish problem and not have them come here. So this was the constellation of circumstances that led to the birth of the Jewish movement at the beginning of the 20th century. And it's, it's important here to note, at that point, in, say, 1913, the percentage of the population that was Jewish in Palestine was around 5%. It was only about 5%. And then the immigration began to intensify over that period. So 1917, Britain, and that's when they issued the Balfour Declaration, that was right after they had taken over Palestine from the Ottomans. So the Ottomans were fighting uh, against Britain, and they were in uh, allied with Germany and Austrian uh, empire and Britain was able to uh, conquer Palestine at that point and kick out the Ottomans allied with the Arabs because the Arabs rose up against the Ottomans and so the British in their um, famous uh, eternal and duplicitous nature they promised the Arabs that they would give them self-determination that they would help them fight against the Ottomans mm. but they also promised the British that they would they also promised the Zionists that they would give them Palestine and they also promised the French that they would give them parts of the Arab world. So they made three promises that they couldn't keep. But just like with the money. It's a lot of double spending. It's a lot of double spending. Exactly. Exactly. That's the perfect way of putting it. It's a lot of double spending. And that's what fiat is optimized for. Wow. It's optimized for fraud and double spending. And as you always say, you know, ruin the money, ruin the world. When the money's broken, everything breaks. And so when the British government began to lie about its bonds, lie about the redeemability of money, lie about the spending on war, it was only inevitable that this would reflect in other parts of their policy. And they lied about the promises that they made for that land in that period. And so at that point, uh, Jewish immigration begins to intensify to Palestine. And of course, you have significant um, local opposition to this because the Palestinians suddenly open the newspaper and the British are saying, yeah, we want to build a national homeland. And so, as you can imagine, they're not very thrilled about this. Mm. You know, before that, there were no problems with Jews. There was no, uh, we need to kick the Jews out. There was no real anti-Semitism problem in Palestine in the same way that you had this in Europe. This is a very important point. So, as we said, since 637, nobody had ever mentioned anything about we need to kick the Jews out. This whole uh, anti-Semitic uh, idea had been very popular in Europe. In all over Europe, you had a very strong anti-Semitic tendencies, but not in Palestine because you had this relatively workable arrangement under the Ottomans, which allowed everybody to coexist because everybody had property rights. Whereas in Europe, remember, Jews had very limited property rights. They couldn't own land. They couldn't work the land. They were stuck in ghettos. They were um, persecuted. And that led to eternal conflicts between the Christian and Jewish populations. Mm. Oh, man, that so, so, a lot to cover there. So I guess starting off, and I, I always trace this back to private property too. It seems like once you start breaking private property, everything starts to come unraveled, right? Or you know, it's another way of saying the lying, right? Um, central bank money printing, I always, I think, 
this can't be overstated enough. It is a violation of private property, right? Like once you start, as you said, they could only sell one third of the bonds. So they needed the central bank to back the, the purchase of the other two. That's basically a confiscation of purchasing power from savers and the pound, I guess, at that time to, to buy these bonds and finance the war. And this is what we're seeing the Fed do today, right? The Fed is buying U.S. bonds, right? The, the foreign foreign demand for U.S. bonds has plummeted. So we have the U.S. Central Bank buying, it, buying up uh, U.S. bonds largely. So that's a pattern or I guess a precedent that was set really early on that we still see repeating today. The other thing I thought was really important that you said, how U.S. was the main creditor to the war effort for a while, but stayed out for a long time. So we were receiving a lot of the gold, right, in payment for, I don't know, munitions, weapons, whatever we're selling. And then eventually the geopolitical power shifts into the hands of the U.S. So it's just another really important instance of how geopolitical power tracks gold flows, right? Like money is power in that sense. And the other thing I thought, and this is maybe ironic, or uh, maybe this is just the tale as old as, as time. You're saying that the Zionists were running away from socialism, basically, which Hoppe again defines as an institutionalized policy of aggression against private property. And then they start running toward this new state, uh, which is they're basically running away from aggression against private property toward aggressing against other people's private property. So my question is, why Palestine? What is it just this beachfront real estate? Like why that part of the world? And why was that promise? And why not anywhere else? I mean, what, what is it that's special about that particular geography? Uh, relative to any other place that that Zionists could have been pointed towards? Well, I think uh, worth mentioning here that the entire idea of a Jewish homeland was plan B for Theodor Herzl. And this was not a religious movement. So if you look at all the early Zionists, they were almost entirely atheists and very, at least very secular. They were not the religious Jews. So this was not a religious movement uh, by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, you still have a very significant amount of religious opposition to Zionism among Orthodox Jews mm -hmm. until today, mm -hmm. even in Israel. Um, so they, they believe it's okay for them to live there, but they don't support the idea of a Jewish state. So for the, it, it was a secular thing, and it was a secular thing that was uh, a reaction to the rise of European nationalism that was you know blood and soil nationalism that we are people with a religion and a vision and a flag and a great leader and this is our land and everybody who's different needs to be kicked out so you have this rise of this uh, form of nationalism in europe at that time and i i recommend here reading theodor herzl's book the jewish state and he discusses uh the what he calls the jewish problem or how do we how, how do we deal with the problem of Jews being stuck in all of these countries that hate them and all of these countries that are developing very strong ethno-religious um, nationalism as a force and a force in which Jews don't belong because you have to be a Christian and Polish to be part of Poland. You have to be Christian and German to be part of the German nation. So how do we deal with that? And his plan A, incidentally, was not Zionism. His, not, his plan A was not uh, uh, a separate Jewish homeland. In fact, he was he he believed in uh, his plan a was assimilation and the conversion he wanted to campaign effectively for the mass conversion of jews into christianity that was plan a and in fact if you read his book this was for me i read it in college and this is this, this was my first introduction to serious anti-semitic thought this was the first time that i read an anti-semite and I was, and, and it's really, it hurts. Like he spoke like a proper anti-Semite. He didn't, he viewed Jews as being inferior in many ways to Europeans. And he believed that they couldn't assimilate. And he believed he gave up on the idea. He, he had fantasies of going to the Pope, representing the Jewish people and asking the Pope to accept all Jewish people into Christianity. And then he said, no, we're just never going to fit in. We need our own country. And then even within that, there were discussions of maybe uh, having the country in Argentina, in Uganda, or I think in Alaska or Nebraska, different places in the US. There were many different places that were discussed. But uh, 
the reason Palestine was chosen, I think, A, is because of the historical importance for Jewish people, which made it a much easier sell than to tell people to go somewhere in the middle of Africa or in the end of the world in Argentina or in uh, Alaska. And the other aspect of it that I think was also relevant was that this was likely to appeal to the British. And that was what made it a, uh, a, an appealing prospect because for the British, this meant foothold in the Middle East. And that was something that you could sell to them because if they were going to get rid of the Ottoman Empire, you would not want to have a united Arab Muslim nation develop in the area of what is the Arab world today. So it would be good to have a state that is dependent on British support in there. And of course, uh, it's uh, it, it's good for uh, having a constant war effort going on, having constant conflict, which is good for business, good for the military business. Um, and so, and, and of course, yeah, it's, it's also very prime real estate. It's a very sweet spot on the Mediterranean coast and it's very close to Europe. So all of these factors, I think, came in uh, and, and made it uh, attractive. And yet, it's still, it's worth remembering, though, that even with all of these things happening in the first half of the 20th century, the vast majority of the world's Jews did not buy into Zionism. They did not move to Israel, Palestine. Even in 1948, it was only... Um, I think it was only about a half a million Jews who were living in Palestine as opposed to a global population of something like 10, maybe 15 million or something like that Jews. Mm -hmm. So leading up to World War II, very few people had moved there. And then in World War II, the immigration intensifies. And a big part of the reason why the immigration intensifies is that the Zionist movement did its best to try and stop Europeans from going, European Jews from leaving Europe and going to the US or Canada or Australia and wanted them to go to Palestine. So they lobbied the Americans to not take in Jewish immigrants because they wanted the Jewish immigrants to go to Palestine. And yet, even with all of that, and then we have the establishment of the Israeli state in 1948. And since then, when we're going to get to that, they offer anybody who's claims to be Jewish from anywhere in the world can go there and own land and get uh, essentially subsidized land. So basically, if you're a Jew who lives in the US or Germany or France or Australia or Ger Argentina, you are just as another citizen. You own land like everybody else. You have to compete on the free market to buy land, to buy a house. But if you decide to go to Israel, you get special treatment in the land market. You get assigned land at a discount, effectively. You get subsidized land. And uh, that's what the Israeli state does. It's essentially just uh, the uh, you, the best way to understand Israel is that it is the distortion of the land market in Palestine, mm -hmm. where the government gets money from world governments, from the US, from Britain previously, and, from, and it gets weapons from its uh, Soviet allies initially, and uses that money and weapons to steal land from Palestinians and assign it to Jews. That's really what it is. And it's, uh, it's even with that, you still, to this day, don't have a majority of Jews in Palestine, which I think is a huge slap in the face of the idea that the Zionist movement has succeeded because the point was to build a national homeland for Jews. Well, here we are 75 years later, and the majority of the world's Jews don't want to live in Palestine, even though they get subsidized land. You know, if you're an American, if you just claim to be Jewish, you go there, you get assigned homes stolen from Palestinians. This is what's happening in the West Bank to today. It's been happening since day one. And the other aspect of it is that almost, I mean, it's, it's roughly even, but it's supposed to be the Jewish homeland. And yet historic Palestine is predominantly, is, it's around 50% non-Jewish, even until today, even after all of the murder and the massacres and the ethnic cleansing, and the expulsion of Palestinians and the house demolitions and the land theft, you still have something like 50% of the population that's not Jewish. So overall, I think the, uh, the uh, these two really, the, these two facts, the majority of Jews are not in Palestine, the majority of people in Palestine are not Jewish, are a big indicator of just how artificial and nonsensical this idea of a Jewish homeland is in a land that when, when this idea first came out, was 95% non-Jewish. So 
the, 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 you know, think of a 5% minority in, um, in Tennessee. That's where you are, right? You live in Tennessee. Imagine a 5% minority in Tennessee. I'm guessing there's probably a 5% German minority in Tennessee. Imagine trying to establish a German homeland in Tennessee when you have a 5% population. Just think how bloody the next 100 years would be if you had the world's strongest governments and the world's uh, richest governments subsidizing and military arming the German minority in Tennessee to try and build a German national homeland and try and get all the world's Germans to move to Tennessee and try to get all the Tennesseans who are not German to get out of Tennessee. Imagine what's going to happen over the next 100 years. So this, for me, is what the struggle and the conflict is about. It's the last 100 years of essentially fiat nationalism of, hey, um, a bunch of people in Britain and a bunch of people in Eastern Europe have decided that this land should be for this group. Mm. And now let's make it happen. Mm. And, you know, if it doesn't happen, then, well, just keep shooting until it does. Keep printing money, keep shooting until it does. The syllabus for my new online economics course, Principles of Economics, is now available on safedean.com. The course will take place over 18 lectures, each based on one chapter from my new book, Principles of Economics, which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course. Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September, 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots, 12 hours apart, to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with a nice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. Are, okay, so, man, so much there too. I, I've been dipping into a book recently called The Metaphysical Club, and I was just going through uh, a history of American philosophical thought, and I was actually shocked to discover, I don't know why I was shocked, I guess I should have been, mid-1800s, they were having legitimate academic debates in institutions like Harvard, other Ivy League institutions about whether or not white people were a superior race. Like these are actual debates. Like they heard that like the verdict was out supposedly. And that just blew my mind. I was like, wow, we're literally 170, 150, 175 years after that, you know? So we're still in kind of this barbaric age where we haven't even figured out that we're all human for God's sake. What, and I haven't read Herschel's book, um, it sounds like then that the this fiat occupation conflict or this this attempt to create an artificial state where there was none, its roots are then in anti-Semitism to some extent, right? You said Herschel didn't want Jewish people to stay in the UK, so he sent them or thought that they should go there. What are the roots of the anti-Semitism in your estimation? Like, what is this just? just classical racism like what what is there a bigger story here is it too much of a, a tangent to go on today what, what are your thoughts about that i mean i'll say i'm not i'm not an expert on the topic um but there are um there are some indications that we could discuss in this regard um so first of all i mean as you said up, up until the mid 20th century even not just the mid 19th century Early 20th century, eugenics and um, um, all of these right. ideas were very popular. So, uh, and people usually associate them with the Nazis, but that's a little bit of post World War II whitewashing in a sense mm -hmm. of not that the Nazis didn't believe those things. Of course they right. did. But the idea that they are purely um, Nazi ideas, I think, is what's uh, the propaganda. Because yeah. if you look at uh, what the New York Times was publishing in 1910 and 1920s, and uh, you know Keynes was a massive eugenicist so these were very popular ideas in Britain and in fact in in, in the US and across the West and this notion of 
the other is different, the other is evil, the other is inferior, and you have mm-hmm. to fight the other is just something that has always existed amongst humanity. But I think what um, what happens is over time, I think the way to understand why these ideas dissipate, dissipate over time is that it's just as humans trade, and as humans um, engage in civilized conduct, they do benefit from uh, dealing with each other in a civilized way by respecting each other's property rights, it becomes much easier for them to understand that the other is fine. So that's why, you know, for all of the woke propaganda about the US being an awful white supremacist, uh, horrific mm-hmm. state today, the reality is I've lived in the US, I've seen Americans, uh, the, the vast majority of Americans are not really racist. Um, they mix people, they mix with people from all over the world. Um, if you just um, respect people in the U.S. and you deal with uh, people with respect and you respect their property rights, then you can fit in. And this is, I mean, obviously I'm not saying it's perfect, it's not entirely colorblind, but it's a lot less racist than the world was 100 years ago. And that's just inevitable because in the U.S. you have a melting pot, really, of people from all over the world. And so you grow up in a place in the U.S. where you're surrounded by people who are Muslim and black and uh, different backgrounds and Asians and Indians and uh, so on. And so you you get to meet with those people, you go to school with them, you buy your morning coffee from them. And so you get to see that they are normal people just like you. And these notions of them being evil, them being inferior, they get dissipated over time. So in Europe, this was not much the case, I think. throughout the medieval period because the world was just not that globalized and people had people would spend the vast majority of their time interacting with the people that are exactly like them and so any small little difference leads you to think that the other is inferior and so um, German people hated Polish people Polish people hated German people and both hated their local Jews who were very different so as technology advances as trade advances we we these things dissipate so this is kind of the general um, a view for it. I think the more uh, specific answers to as to Jewry in Europe, I think they come back to the fact that um, usury was forbidden for European Christians. So the church forbid European Christians from engaging in usurious lending, mm-hmm. but Jews were allowed to do it. And also Jews were discriminated against in that they couldn't own land and they couldn't work in farming. So they ended up being um, corralled really into these industries that were um, urban industries. They lived in cities, they lived in their own ghettos, they were prevented from uh, having access to land, they couldn't become landowners, they couldn't uh, become, uh, they, they couldn't work the land. And so this uh, this basically made them the banking class of Europe. And of course, a lot of people are constantly having uh, trouble with their banks, not necessarily always because the bank is bad a lot of times it's because you don't manage your own money and the bank is the mirror that reflects to you your own uh, incompetence in money so so everybody hates their credit card company but it's not the credit card company that uh, made you buy all the stupid crap that you don't need so i think uh, that is a part of it and uh, this this is why that this this is this goes back centuries that you have um, christian populations that would place Jews in those ghettos, they would prevent them from being able to buy land. And so if you study the history, you know, in in, in European cities, the Jewish ghettos were pretty strict that you could only own land or property there. And then as the population grows, these places become extremely crowded and the rest of the city was off limits for uh, the Jews. So I think this is why historically that was the case. And incidentally, this was not the case in the Middle East. So up until the 1930s, 40s, you didn't have this in the Middle East. So Jews in the early 20th century, in, in particularly in Iraq and in Egypt, they formed a uh, very significant um, economic minority in the country. And there was not anything like the kind of anti-Semitism that you had in Europe. And it's easy to just point at things that have happened after Zionism came and say, see, Muslims and Jews are always going to hate each other. But I believe my explanation is a lot more uh, coherent, which is that when Jews and Muslims and Christians could own land in Iraq, 
the conflict and the uh, racism and the hatred there was very minimal and it wasn't uh, intractable and it wasn't bloody. Mm -hmm. And then when you start introducing these ideas of land should only belong to this religion or land should only belong to that religion, that's when things become ugly and bad. So it's it, it's well known that uh, Jews had always had better uh, living standards under Muslims than they did under Europeans. So in Spain, for instance, the um, the Muslims well, when the Muslims ruled Spain, the Jews were there, and then when the Europeans took over, they kicked out the Jews and the Muslims together. And uh, I think quite common, and and you see this. I mean, and and again, of course, the example of Palestine that I mentioned when we started. That it was when the Jews went into Palestine. Uh, sorry, when the Arabs went into Palestine, is when the Jews came back. So, among Islam, there was always, I would believe, a much better framework for accommodating Christians and Jews among Islamic uh, lands than um, in Europe, than, than European Christendom, and particularly not just Christendom. I think more importantly, European nationalism, modern secular European nationalism. That did a terrible job of accommodating uh, mm -hmm. Jews. Interesting. Um, yeah, so the theme I'm picking up on here is like the the stability of laws and equality in the eyes of the law seem to be essential to peace. When you start having laws that are changing or laws that, you know, what is it? Laws for thee, not for me kind of thing. Un unevenly applied laws or legal frameworks which I guess gets into the term apartheid, which we'll, we'll get into eventually, you start to get a lot more conflict rather than than peaceful resolution, um, which is the point, right? So back to private property, that's the point of private property is to resolve conflict, right? To resolve yes, conflict over exactly. scarce resources, so. Exactly, I mean, when I, when I was writing my third book, Principles of Economics, this just, uh, as I was writing the book, it just became very, very clear to me that I really understood what Mises says when he says, human civilization and capitalism are inextricably linked to and d dependent on private property. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a system of private property where people acquire property legitimately, and there are ways of acquiring property legitimately, this is a very, by the way, this is one of the major psyops in today's world that if you talk to the average person, they have been conditioned to believe that all property is illegitimate. And this is a very leftist mm -hmm. idea and it's a very pernicious idea which is that all property comes from violence, all property comes from aggression, mm -hmm. and all property comes because of government. Only because we have government do we have property. And this is a huge lie, because property rights predate governments mm -hmm. and they survive governments even after governments fall. Mm -hmm. There are ways of acquiring property legitimately. You acquire property legitimately if you homestead something that is not owned by anybody. So you go to a plot of land that nobody claims and you put a fence around it and you say, this is Robert's home. And then that's yours. That's legitimately yours because nobody had claimed it before that. Or you acquire it from its owner willingly. So you own the pl plot of land. I come, I give you money and you give it to me. It becomes my land. Or you just gift it to me. It becomes my land. That's how you can acquire property um, legitimately. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the world is legitimate property. The majority of the world has been acquired legitimately and nobody disputes the property rights of people in land. Most of the world's land was a homestead and then um, traded freely and the property for it is legitimate. Governments are legitimate to the extent that they respect property rights and they're illegitimate to the extent that they overrule property rights. Mm -hmm. And so whenever a government is respectful of property rights, then you see that the property rights system leads to uh, the development of capitalism, the development of improvement in living standards. And then when you, they disrespect it, you see that society falls apart. And that's that's a very, very, very Austrian way of looking at things, but I believe it's absolutely correct. And thinking about it and reading Austrians over the years has only solidified my ability to understand the conflict in the Middle East, because it really offers the best framework for understanding this, because we, you know, we've spoken so far about the British mandate and the period where the uh, Jewish migration started to Palestine. It, really only went to uh, shit in 1948 because the establishment of Israel destroyed the property rights of Palestinians. And if you think of it this way, which nobody likes to think of it this way, and this is really, for me, the key thing, that if you think of the 
average way in which a, a, a person looks at the conflict. Oh, it's just interminable uh, Jewish Muslims squabbling that's gone on forever and it'll go on forever. No. In 1948, there was a massive crime against the property rights of Palestinians. And that crime has not been resolved since then. In fact, the crime has continued to intensify. And the Zionist political project can only function by aggressing against the property rights of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And for the reason for that is, if you look at historically, so many people will tell you that the reason, you know, the, the, the Jewish migrants to Palestine came in and they, um, they bought the land from Palestinians. And of course, they did buy some land. Nobody disputes that. There's how, there had always been Jewish uh, property ownership in Palestine. But in 1948, the, um, in 1948, this is, this is a great map that shows us what it was like. Over 90% of the privately owned property in Palestine was not owned by Jews by 1948. So yes, you had a lot of Europeans come in and they did bring in a lot of money from Europe and they did buy a lot of land. But buying a whole country is not easy. It's not easy to buy a whole country the size of New Jersey. I mean, just think about it. If you tried to get a 5% minority of New Jersey today to own all of New Jersey in 30 years, mm. it's tricky, right? That's a lot of land. It's not easy. There's a lot of expensive land in New Jersey and you can't just buy it. And the more you bid for it, the wealthier that the current landowners become. So if you're, you know, let's say the 5% minority of New Jersey wants to buy New Jersey right. and they start bidding up. Well, if you're not from the 5%, let's say German minority, and now you've got a larger amount of land, you sell a little bit of it to the to to them now you don't need to sell any of the rest of the land so mm -hmm. your the price that you would accept for the rest of it becomes much much higher mm -hmm. so by 1948 the zionist movement had only acquired something like nine percent seven percent depends exactly on how you calculate it the most re is the most generous estimate would be about the 12 percent it's somewhere between seven and 12 percent depending on the methodology that you use and we could get into the different classifications of land and here, of course, Zionists usually like to overplay the aspect of um, trying to emphasize that it was land that they, they bought from the uh, absentee landlords and the uh, peasants who worked on the land didn't own the land. Even, with all, even, even granting all of these controversies to the Zionists, the most generous estimate that you could get is they had 12% of the land by 1948. Mm. And so this is... This is Palestine, and this is based on the United Nations study. So you remember then the United Nations had a mandate at that. The British had the mandate, and the United Nations were working on developing a solution for this to try and build a Jewish homeland while protecting the rights of the Palestinians. So they went in in the 1940s and surveyed the land everywhere. And this is what they came up with. If you look at this graph here, every single district in Palestine, the majority of the land was not owned by Jews. So you see here, in blue is Jewish land, in green is Palestinian land, and in yellow is public land. And in all of those places, the green is bigger than the yellow. The place where you have the biggest concentration of, uh, sorry, green is bigger than the blue. In all, the place where you have the biggest concentration of land uh, in Jewish hands was Yatha, which is modern day Tel Aviv. And that there they had only 39% of the land. In Haifa, they had 35% of the land. And uh, in Tulkarem, that's where my family originates from, they had about 17% of the land. But in Nazareth, 28%, Acre, 10%, Safad, 18%. And then in the rest of the places, it's 1%, 2%, 14%, mm. something like that. Overall, for the whole land overall, only 12% of the most generous way of looking at it. More accurately, you could, uh, you could make a good case for it being only about 7% of the privately owned land was owned by the Zionist movement. And so the United Nations then, of course, being the fiat institution that it is, looks at this and says, all right, well, yes, the Jews only own 7% of the land, but we are, we are given a mandate to make a Jewish nation. So how do we make this happen? And they propose this partition plan, which to this day, a lot of Zionists like to say, well, you know, the Palestinians rejected the partition plan, so they only have themselves to blame, as if your property rights are up for 
decree by the United Nations. And I'm, you know, how would you feel if somebody came and said, well, we're going to partition Tennessee between the Germans and the non-Germans in Tennessee. And sorry, Robert, your house happens to be in the German area. And so now you are going to be ruled by Germans. So what they did when they, when they partitioned that land was they gave 55% of Palestine to the Jewish state, 45% of Palestine to the uh, Arab state, and they left a small part, which was Jerusalem, to be under international supervi- supervision. But, of course, the reality on the ground at that point was that Jews were only a third of the population and only about 7% of the land or 10% of the land or something like that. Mm. So just imagine how difficult it would be to do this, to take a third of the population on 7% of the land and give them 55% of the country and then have the rest of the population uh, in the other uh, 45%. And then, of course, the problem here was that even within this arrangement, the Jewish state still had a majority Arab population a majority non-Jewish population. So Jews were still a minority in their own state that was carved out specifically to try and maximize the areas of the land that they had owned. And so, um, and we should also say here that when I say that there was Jewish owned, more than 90% of the land that was owned by Jews at that time was not privately owned by Jews. It was owned by the Jewish National Fund. Mm -hmm. So this was essentially a government entity, which after the establishment of the state, it turned into what is called the Israeli Land Authority, And that is the uh, monster that just keeps eating Palestinian land. And it owns today and controls and administers more than 90% of the land that is under the sovereignty of Israel. And it's constantly eating more land in the West Bank as we speak uh, by kicking Palestinians out of their homes and taking their land and giving it to uh, Israeli settlers from Brooklyn or from all over the world who come in and get it. So back to 1948, this is the travesty. This is the property rights crime. 90% plus of the land was not owned by Jews, and yet the United Nations decided that we need to find a way to make this Jewish state happen. And then they assigned that land to the Jewish state. And of course, the Palestinians uh, would not accept a movement, uh, something like that. You know, uh, they would be a minority in the other state, and they would be effectively, um, it, it was very clear that at that point, the uh, yeah, the Zionist movement was not just a peaceful movement. They had militias and they had military. They had enormous amount of weapons that they had acquired from European armies and from the Soviets, so their Soviet allies, because remember, this was at that point a very socialist movement because it was all, um, it, it was mostly Eastern European socialist Jews and it was, was uh, it had all these ideas about kibbutzes and the um, communal farms and all of these uh, cooperatives. And so the Soviets were very sympathetic to it and they gave a lot of weapons to support this. And so it was very clear that they weren't going to be satisfied with just taking this land and living as a minority in their own country. They were going to kick the Palestinians out of their homes. And this is starting since the 1930s with the collaboration of the British. So the British repressed the Palestinians from the 1930s, disarmed the Palestinians. This is a very important chapter from 1936 to 39. This was the biggest uh, interwar revolt in the world against colonialism. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians, the term intifada gets used a lot, but the first time there was an intifada was against the British actually, 1936 to 1939, because by 1936 it became very clear to the Palestinians, this Zionism thing is serious, they're going to take our country and they're going to give it to these Europeans and we need to fight the British. And so you had a popular uprising of people rising up against the British Empire and that was the biggest revolt, the biggest anti-colonial revolt, the revolt in the uh, period of between the two world wars. And unfortunately, it ended with the, uh, the suppression of Palestinian nationalism, and they disarmed the Palestinian population. That was the really horrible thing about it. So after 1939, Palestinians were essentially left disarmed, while the Zionists were left armed. And the British continued to arm the Zionists and continued to allow them to bring in weapons, even though nominally and um, in principle, they would say that, you know, they're trying to limit uh, Jewish migration and they're trying to limit the importation of arms. It wasn't true. They built a massively powerful army post-1939. And then when World War I, World War II broke out, immigration intensified, 
weapons intensified. And you had a lot of the Jewish population come in from the uh, from the militaries of Europe. So they, they were very well trained and they had combat experience and they had modern weaponry. And they continued to accumulate it up until 1947. And then in 1947 is really when they make their move. So the mandate plan comes along and then the Zionist movement begins the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And here I highly recommend a book by an Israeli historian called Ilan Pape that's called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. And it was uh, it, it most, this is the kind of propaganda version that you get of this is, well, 1948, the UN had offered the Arabs a state and then the Arabs said no. Instead, they decided they were going to throw the Jews in the sea. So the Arab armies attacked. The Israelis defended themselves and they managed to secure the territory that they had been assigned by the United Nations and they got a little bit extra because they managed to win the war. And that's what happens with wars. Nonsense. That's not what happened. Before any Arab army had entered Palestine, since 1947, Israel had had a plan for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and specifically for the expulsion or as they call it the technical term as you know they're the kings of the euphemisms as they call it the uh, um, transfer is the word that the Zionist leadership have always used just we're going to transfer the population mm. sounds very benign and uh, uh, helpful and so 1947 this plan has been drawn out from the 1930s and, and Ilan Pape details the documents that show how the planning had happened and how they looked at it from a geographic perspective wherein they had about 7% of the land. They wanted to make that 7% contiguous and they needed to get rid of the areas that were getting in the way, which was a lot of areas, right? So they needed to murder an enormous number of people and expel an enormous number of people. And that's exactly what they did starting in 1947. So 1947, they begin the mass expulsion of Palestinians. They begin the mass murder of Palestinians. And at that point, the British were still, um, the, ma the British mandate was still ongoing. But then uh, the British leave on uh, May 14th and the Arab armies had not entered or declared war because they didn't want to declare war on Britain because if you wanted to invade in 1947, mm -hmm. while the Zionists were um, transferring and murdering the Palestinian population and 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 kicking out entire villages, if the Arab army would go in, they would be fighting, uh, declaring war against Britain. Mm -hmm. So only when Britain leaves on May 15, 1948, do the Arab armies declare war. No, well, first of all, actually Israel de declares its independence, and then the Arab armies declare war. But they, uh, the, the Israelis had already begun the mass ethnic cleansing of Palestine. They'd arguably had already expelled about 250 to 300,000 Palestinians. And then uh, when the war happens, again, the other common misconception here is that the war was to get rid of the Israelis and to kill the Israelis and throw them in the sea. And this is completely false because it was never on the cards for the Arab armies because I mean, you're talking about amateur armies that had never fought a war before, new armies, they didn't have the modern weaponry of the European military. They didn't have anything like the modern weaponry that the Zionist movement had. And they were on foreign terrain. The Zionists had been on this land. They had fortified uh, the land. They had parts of the lands that they had won, that they had bought, where they had you know their strongholds. And then over the period from 1947 to 1948, they'd managed to expel a lot of the land. And they'd built their strategic positions so that they had the hilltops, they had all of the um, important positions that they could take on invaders. Of course, if, if, if you're defending, you're in the much uh, bigger advantage than the attacker. And this was, uh, you know, if you, um, Avi Schleim, another Israeli historian who's written a book called The Iron Wall, and he talks about the history of 1948. Uh, there was, I wouldn't say, uh, and, and actually he calls it collusion, also wrote a book called Collusion Across the Jordan, that the Jordanian military at that point had no illusions about the idea that they were going in and that they would be able to just end the Zionist project, that it was not remotely feasible. In fact, they were negotiating with the Zionists and they were trying to avoid having to go into the war. And what they did was that they tried to secure as much of the land as they could, but that was it. They, they, they There was no 
illusion about them being able to get rid of, say, the get into Tel Aviv. At no point did the Jordanian military or the Egyptian military get into the land that was allocated to the Jewish state by the mandate. So all they did was that they tried to secure the land that was not allocated to the Jewish state from the mandate and try and keep it Arab and try and maintain the Arab population in there. So rather than a genocidal war against the Jews, this can be better understood as a humanitarian intervention to try and stop the genocide of the Palestinians, which was mm. taking place. And it didn't succeed, um, but it succeeded to some extent. It kept about 22% of the land outside of the control of the Zionist movement. So whereas the mandate had said 55% mm -hmm. would go to the Jewish state, they ended up with about 78% of the land. So 22% remained in the hands of Jordan and Egypt. And that's how um, the war in 1948 ended. So it was a massive war of aggression against the Palestinian population and against the property rights of Palestinians. And the important thing is that after this war ended, the Palestinians who were expelled are not allowed to return to their lands. They're not allowed to return to their homes. But, and this is really the most indefensible thing in the whole thing, anyone who claims to be Jewish from anywhere in the world can go to Palestine and get assigned land by the Israel Land Authority which was the Jewish National Fund earlier, mm -hmm. and get that land effectively at a, a subsidized rate. But it is not available for the people who owned it, who were expelled at gunpoint in 1947 and 1948. Mm -hmm. No matter how much money you have, you can't buy your land back. So my wife is from Yaffa, which is now an out, on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Um, it's, it's a part of Tel Aviv. Now... There's no amount of money that she can grant us in Africa. That's it. Whereas you could be an American Brooklyn, Tina from Australia, and you migrate there, you go and you find that, and you say, I'd like to live there, and then you just sign to you by the Israel Land Authority. And it's arguably, you know, even if you own it legally in Israel, it's not really ownership because ownership means being able to do whatever you want. Well, you can't sell it to my wife. So if you claim to be Jewish, you go and you get my wife's family's home. You can't go and turn around and say, all right, well, I'm going to sell it to the Palestinian family that was living here 60, uh, 70 years ago. You cannot do that. So ultimately, the land in Palestine is effectively under the control of the Israel Land Authority. And if you look at their Wikipedia page, it says they administer about 93% of the land of historic Palestine or the land that is under Israel. And so that effectively is the 78% that is Israel proper plus 93% uh, of the 78%. But also on top of that, they keep adding more and more lands in the West Bank. So they keep acquiring more and more parts of the West Bank where I grew up and where it's not possible for Palestinians to expand into their lands. The land's constantly being taken away. You can't get permits to build houses as a Palestinian. And if you try and build your own house, they'll demolish it and then they'll take the land and they'll give it to somebody. So... There's, um, in fact, let's check this out. The Israeli Committee on Housing Demolitions. This is another Israeli uh, group, um, really a great bunch of people. They have collected statistics on the demolition of houses over the years, and it is absolutely astonishing. It has been something like from 1947 until November 2023, as you can see here, circa around 120,000 homes have been demolished by the Israeli state. 120,000 non-Jewish homes. Muslim and Christian-owned homes have been demolished since 1967, just since 1967, actually. Uh, no, actually, since from uh, 1947. And, uh, well, actually, to begin from 1936. So from 1936 until today, They've demolished something like 120,000 homes. And then uh, remember in Palestine with pretty high fertility, or at least we did until very recently. So most of these homes, you know, then they're not like American homes with uh, right. 3.5 kids and a dog right. and a cat. And most houses have something like seven people in them, you know, something like that. Right. So that's around a million people's homes demolished over the past 70 years. And it's done, uh, as you can see, through all kinds of... Um, reasons 
punitive demolitions. So if you're involved or if somebody in your family is involved in any resistance to Israel, you can get your homes demolished. Administrative demolish, demolitions for lack of a building permit. So they won't give you a building permit on your own land. And then if you try and build something on your own land, they will then demolish it and then maybe even confiscate your land. Judicial demolitions, um, and this is um, by judicial order rather than administrative order, but it's also very similar. And then land clearing operations and military demolitions, which is, you know, well, we need this for security reasons. So all of your property rights are invalid because we need it for security reasons. And then undefined demolitions, you know, creative reasoning. Well, who needs the reason anyway when, um, while you're at it, you know, after 120,000 homes, who's even counting? This is, um, I guess, a great time to invoke the word apartheid. Um, as I understand it, it is, as we said earlier, rules for the, not for me, like a two-tiered rule system, basically. So when you're describing that refugees not being allowed to return to their homes, so the individuals that were that were forcibly removed from their homes are not allowed to return... But then there's another set of rules that apply to, I guess, Jewish people just by ethnicity, not even the individuals that were involved in anything. They can come and get subsidized land in place of the, the refugees that were pushed out of their homes. Is this, And you, you used another term there, too, that I wanted to ask about colonialism. Like, is this just modern colonialism? And then we are getting this narrative of it being a war somehow like a conflict, a, a religious dispute of, or of some sort, but it really just seems like this effort to colonize and take land from other people, as humans have done, by the way, for basically all of human history. Is this just the latest case of that? You know, um, I have a little bit of a um, very uncommon position on this, which is that uh, this isn't really colonialism because it's much worse than colonialism. Look at colonialism in Europe, colonialism time. This, this is going to get me in trouble with a lot of uh, pro dying people because this is, uh, you know, the, the anti-colonialist propaganda is strong in this aspect. But in fact, a lot of colonialism did not involve taking uh, land that was already owned. So in many of those cases, a lot of the colonialism was private individuals and private companies going to these countries, or to go, so British or French or uh, um, Spanish people, going to areas of land where there was no property rights and there were no clear owners of the land. And so in many cases, it would be a private company that would go and it would take uninhabited land and uh, build its headquarters and uh, start planting in it, start operating in it. I'm not saying that's exclusively the case. Of course, there was a lot of land theft and there were a lot of wars and there was a lot of conquest. But a lot of the times, it wasn't like this. It wasn't this much. In other words, colonialism, you could say that in many of the cases, there was, and in fact, before... Um, um, Initially, colonialism was more of a private initiative thing. So it was private individuals who would go from Britain to India and recognize right. that, hey, we can bring engines from the UK, sell them in India, and then we can take spices and foods from India and sell them in the UK, and that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that's trade. And as long as you don't violate anybody's property rights, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. Then eventually, as this grows along and it gets a lot bigger, then you start getting the British military invading and fighting and uh, imposing rules on it. But this is this is different because this is this is really more genocidal than colonial. In other words, it's look, we have entire cities in Palestine. There were entire cities in Palestine that had been there for hundreds and thousands of years. People had lived in Haifa, in Acre, in Yaffa, in Jerusalem, in uh, Safad, in all of these cities that, that people had been living there for hundreds and thousands of years. You have houses in that city that go back hundreds and thousands of years individual houses that had been there forever and you had people go and shoot at people in those houses bomb their homes shell them and tell them leave or we're going to kill you this is what happened 
1947. I'm sure this has happened in colonialism, but I think it's, it honestly understates the extent of the um, Zionist aggression against Palestinian to just call it colonialism. Mm. Because in many cases, colonialism did not involve uh, the flagrant violation of uh, the local population's property rights mm. like this. In other words, you look at most of the colonial world today, um, in many of those places, the, the local population maintained their property rights. So if you go to a, a city in Africa or Asia that was colonized, the local population, yes, they were ruled by the British or they were ruled by the French, but you still had the legitimate property rights that had been there before the British came and that remained there through the British rule and mm. continued after the British rule. So in other words, you could look at a place like Egypt, you know, in Cairo, people owned land in Cairo. They owned it before the British came, they owned it while the British were there, and they owned it after the British had left. That's why I don't think colonialism quite does it justice. From my property rights perspective, of course, this isn't to uh, uh, th this isn't to say colonialism was always a good thing. This isn't to say that colonialism didn't involve aggression. Yes, there was aggression and there was war, but in most colonial uh, projects, you did respect the property rights of uh, the existing population, and they these property rights did remain in place. Mm. And a lot of people like to compare it to the uh, Native Americans. Say, well, and, and a lot of Americans have this idea. Well, look, uh, this is what we did to the Native Americans. I disagree. It's not exactly similar to what they did to the Native Americans. Of course, there was a lot of aggression against the Native American, and um, uh, there was a lot of theft, but there was no um, system of private property rights under the Native Americans. And so, if, in my opinion, it is perfectly legitimate for a European to go to the U.S., to go to what was America at that time, I'm, and take unclaimed land and homestead it. Mm -hmm. For me, homesteading would have been legitimate. Just because you're white European doesn't mean you can't homestead. You can homestead. And so a lot of the early colonies in the Americas, they cannot be compared to Zionist um, conquest of Palestine because there was no aggression against the property of uh, the Native Americans because the Native Americans were to a large extent nomadic and they didn't have private concept of uh, uh, concept of private property rights in land. They didn't, yeah. didn't have the concept of property in objects. You could own things as a Native American, mm -hmm. but they didn't have private in There was legitimate, in my opinion, um, anybody to homestead that land. So Native Americans could have homestead and um, Europeans could have homestead. And of course, yes, there was aggression. And if you read the history of this, there was a lot of aggression against um, uh, against Native Americans and against some of the Native American tribes, where even though they might not have private properties, in many cases, they had areas that were clearly theirs and they were living in it. And then the, uh, government, the, the American government would come and displace them in order to build railroads or in order mm -hmm. to build uh, something or the other. But... So, um, my controversial opinion here is that colonialism doesn't quite do, do it justice. This is just land theft. Yes. Yeah. Because the property rights were in place. That makes sense. Um, another thing that came up for me here is I have listened to the hardcore history podcast a few times and a, a theme that comes up there a lot are how certain societies that have certain power projection capabilities, certain military technologies. They tend to just, it's almost like a, it's brutal, it's immoral, it's awful, but it's, we've seen it happen time and time again, where a certain group of people have access to weapons that others don't. The Native Americans would be a good example, right? Like they didn't have firearms, I don't think, before the Europeans arrived. And so we kind of bowled over them with our technological advantage. Is that something that's at play here as well? Is it, we've obviously got, you know, British imperialism rolling into this area and then and then arming uh zionists and whatnot is there's there's some element of that i don't know what that's not colonialism per se um but it, but it's just another instance of that i guess um and yeah th there's definitely an element of truth to that because the europeans yeah i mean this was the this was the time in which the industrial revolution was beginning to spread worldwide so if you look at it 
Palestine's progress at that point up until the 1930s was very similar to it was what you would expect geographically. So mm -hmm. the uh, industrial revolution started in North and West Europe, and then it spread out and it spread out um, well Northwest Europe and the US, and then it started to spread out. So Southern Europe got the engine after Northern Europe. And then the north of the uh, North Africa and West Asia got it after Southern Europe. Yeah. So you know, by 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 these measures of um, progress, literacy, and so on, Palestine was as as its geography would predict. It was similar to Lebanon and Syria and Turkey. It was better than Turkey because Turkey, say, was uh, you know the hinterland of Turkey was more isolated, um, whereas Palestine was mostly coastal. So. It was a quick technology could diffuse quickly, mm -hmm. but yeah, but the, but but um, you had a population that came in from Europe with that technology and then used it aggressively against the yes. local population. Right. Whereas everywhere else, the technology just spread naturally and um, through market processes. Yeah, yeah. By no means is it a justification; just an observation that these when people get a hold of tools when they're unevenly distributed. They tend to be used aggressively right, by one group against another, and it's. I, I just think it's it's better to kind of look at it. It helps you depoliticize the conversation about this topic. It's like humans are doing this again, like we've done this many times before. Again, doesn't mean it's right. It's terrible and it's awful, but but it is this sort of dark side of, of humanity that we need to address. Um, I want it. So we hit on 1948. The Nakba, which is, I think, translates as the tragedy or the travesty, um, and the, the 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 violation of private property and the sanctity of private property and the rule and all of that. What do we? How do we bridge from 1948 into the present? And we've we've mentioned the word apartheid a number of times. Is that the right classification for this? Are we saying this is a, a an Israeli occupation of Palestine? Um, that's that is basically a, an episode or an act of apartheid, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we so after 1948 we get this system where you have really the one sovereign. And well, I should say no. From 1948 until 1967, there were three sovereigns in historic Palestine. So there was Israel that controlled about 78 percent of the land. And then there was Gaza controlled by the Egyptians. And the West Bank was controlled by the Jordanians, and during that period, um, you got to remember that the, the the centers of Palestinian population and the centers of Palestinian uh, nationalism and the, the political leadership of Palestine were mostly in the areas that were conquered in 1948, and the population had been dissipated to Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Egypt, as well as the West Bank in Gaza, and so during that time. It's under Jordanian and um, uh, uh, Egypt Egyptian rule, as well as uh, Israeli rule in the West Bank. Uh, sorry, the Israeli rule in the majority of the country. Then in 1967, we get the 1967 war. Most people think it was a war that was launched by the Arab militaries against Israel. In fact, it was launched by Israel. Israel launched the first strike, and. Um, it destroyed the Egyptian air force. Uh, that was like the first strike where they they uh, destroyed the Egyptian air force in Egypt, and that then effectively paralyzed the Arab military effort. And so then they were able to capture the West Bank and Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula, mm. and um, and the Golan Heights from Syria. So they occupied these lands, and then. Uh, basically they became the only country the only sovereign in the west bank now since then we've really had what you could call a, uh, an apartheid system i think by any reasonable definition of the term in that you have one government but you have two sets of rules for the population and um so within israel you have an apartheid of sort in which you're only allowed to own land uh, from the jewish national fund if you are jewish and then in the West Bank, you had, um, you know, you weren't given citizenship. So Israel ruled that land. This is what is unique about it. So in many cases, governments will take over territories 
And this is why, you know, it's just war and this is what happens in wars. No, it's not. This is governments will take over, ter- take over a territory. They will conquer it. But they will keep local population in it. And they will nationalism. And they will give them nationality. Allow them to maintain their property rights. Well, in the West Bank, you have this unique situation where the government took over that land. But it does not give the population its national, nationality. does not allow them to become Israeli citizens. And the reason for that, of course, is that they want it to remain a Jewish state. And if you let in um, the population of the West Bank, then the majority will not be a uh, uh, Jewish majority. And so they continue to rule over it. And then you begin the process of expansion. And it's really, I mean, most Israelis, I would say, up until recently, most Israelis were not on board with this project. And it's one of those things where you like to not think of it. You know, a lot of people don't like to think about what the nasty things that their government does. So they like to prepare, prefer to just keep the pleasant vision of their government as they see it. So most people don't really want to come to terms with what this means. But really, since 1967, the uh, more extremist elements within Zionism had been very clear about the need to go and conquer the West Bank. Well, they've already conquered it, but the need to settle the West Bank and drive out the local population. And so it begins with small efforts at settlements, which were blessed by the government, subsidized by the government, financed and protected militarily by the government from the 1960s and continues to this day. And so today you've got something like 800 to 900,000 Israeli settlers living in the West Bank. And that's why it's not just apartheid, it's uh, it's, it's really um, slow motion expulsion, transfer, genocide. In other words, the Israeli military controls the area and it's constantly confiscating land from Palestinians and allocating it to Israeli settlements. And so these settlements continue to expand and they continue to build more and more lands and more and more homes. And then it's a, it's, it's, it's a very... Um, it's it's a, it's a very uh, um, incremental almost incremental process, but it's almost inevitable the logic of it, which is mm. all right. So this hill is very important for us for military purposes. So we need to acquire this hill to build a military base. Mm. Well, now we have a military base, but we need homes for the mm. military people. Mm. So then we need to build more homes around it. And then we need a road to connect this the, uh, the military base and the homes to uh, the nearest part of Israel. So we're going to confiscate more land. Mm-hmm. Now, well, on the land there, we need to secure that road. And so we're going to be building more military bases and then we're going to be building more homes. And then we need to build a cell phone tower here. So then in order to build the cell phone tower, we need to uh, confiscate your land. And so they take somebody's land and they build a cell phone tower and then they need to secure the cell phone tower. So they need a military base and then they need more settlements. And it's just a constant process of constantly finding more and more rationalization. And it's just all being done on Palestinian land. And it's all being done with a very, very strategic view in terms of the conquering of land and that they're taking the all the important hilltops, they're taking all the important water sources, they're taking the water that the Palestinian cities depend on. And this is the really pernicious thing about it in that they're suffocating the Palestinian cities and surrounding them. They're taking their water resources and they're turning the Palestinian areas into little prisons isolated from one another. And this is the worst thing about the West Bank right now. And, you know, people say, well, the Palestinians could have just had a state in 2000 uh, if Arafat had accepted the Israeli proposal. Well, the guy who gave him the proposal himself, the Israeli foreign minister at that time, Shlomo Ben-Ami, he said, I would not have accepted that if I was a Palestinian Mm. because what they were getting was Bantustans, to borrow the South African terms, you know, little tiny territories that are, um, and and again, uh, comparing it to Bantustans, I think is not even, um, doesn't really do it justice. You didn't have this level of walls and watchtowers and complete political control over the areas in South Africa that you have in Palestine today. And the tech that Israel deploys for this is just incredible. I mean, it's, it's it's a big giant prison. It's 200 prisons, really. The the West Bank Palestinian communities are something like 200 prisons that are, are connected only through area, through Israeli checkpoints. And so mm. you've got in, in, in around 2000 and uh, 
two, they started building the wall around these areas. And so, you know, it, 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 this is presented as if it is a defensive move. Like we're just building a wall because we don't want to have terrorism, but you're building a wall in somebody's living room effectively because you're confiscating the other half of their home. So, you know, they say good walls make good neighbors. Well, mm. yeah, but you build a good wall is built between your land and your neighbor's land. It's not built across half of your neighbors, not even half. So if you look at the West Bank right now. This is a literal divide and conquer, right? And uh, Yeah. And this is the area, is this the area that is described as the largest open air prison or internment camp in the world? Yeah, I mean, it is larger than uh, the, uh, it is larger than uh, Gaza. People usually describe Gaza as the biggest mm. prison, but you could also say that this is the case mm. uh, in the West Bank. So yeah, let me show you this map. So within the West Bank, you have three areas, area A, area B, and area C. Area A is what is administered by the Palestinian Authority. That's 18%. And then area B is 22%, which is administered jointly by the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. And then area C, which is administered by Israel, is 60%. So within the 22%, they've got uh, 60% of the West Bank. And, that, and this is what it looks like. The orange part is area C. As you can see, it's the majority of the mm -hmm. land. And then area B is the dark blue. And then area A is the light blue. So these light blue areas are effectively where the vast majority of the Palestinian population is hemmed in and they're surrounded by a wall and they're not allowed to leave without going through Israeli checkpoints. I mean, it, really moving from one of these areas to the other is as complicated as crossing an international border. And it's an international border that is constantly getting shut down and closed down. And so since things have uh, broken out in Gaza in October, it's extremely difficult for Palestinians to move around. So people can't just move from Ramallah here to Nablus or to Janine or so. It's not easy to move around. And these areas are all isolated from one another by walls. And so in the orange areas, this is where the settlements are growing, the settlements are expanding, and the settlements are acquiring more and more of the resources. And then you have 800, 900,000 settlers who are um, not the most pleasant neighbors to have, if you ask me, because um, you know if you look at the history of what they've been doing over the past uh, few years, it has been horrific. I mean, they, they they've uh, you know people get really worked up because their TV told them about all these horrible things that happened on October seven most of which turned out to be completely not true. So that it's very clear that there was no beheaded babies. There were no burning babies. There was only one child that was killed and it was through um, the fire. So all of the stories about beheading and burning and all of that stuff uh, was not true. The, 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 the child was caught in crossfire. So it was a bullet. So all of the stories about horrible things done to babies were clearly false. All of the stories about rape are also clearly false. There's absolutely no evidence about any of that stuff. In fact, and, you know, they, they, it was all just um, uh, propaganda and the people who did say that they did see it. Um, uh, th there's been very extensive documentation of how they've changed their testimony several times and how they have not been able to establish these cases. In fact, just a couple of days ago, the Israeli government was calling on people who have evidence of these things to step forward to try and present them because they're trying to build a, they're trying to build a, a clear cut criminal case of saying that these rapes happened, but they didn't happen. But in any case, people get so agitated about what happened on October 7. Well, if you live in the West Bank, this is a daily occurrence. It's mm -hmm. entirely, it's entirely uh, common, you know, um, that's just like, if you look at the daily newspaper uh, in there, it's just, this is always the news. Like a, a bunch of settlers walked into a school and started shooting at the school and a bunch of settlers walked into the um uh, the or olive field and started shooting at the farmers who were harvesting the olives and then they shot away they shot them and then they, they harvested the olives and then they, they cut down the olive trees and olive trees in palestine are enormously important some of them are a thousand years old and they are enormously important part of the diet people live off of olive oil mm -hmm. it might olive oil might be the um one plant food that is the least okay. worst <laughs> yeah no, yeah it's it, it's the closest thing to an animal food you could almost i like to call olives ruminant plants they're like ruminant animals almost 
So you can almost live on them and they're a very essential part of the diet. And, you know, the settlers target these trees specifically in order to destroy Palestinians' livelihood to make life impossible. Yeah. So life since 1967 in the West Bank has been an attempt by these settlers to drive out the Palestinians and they are armed and funded and protected by the Israeli military. So you see, um, that, and then you get these pogroms where the settlers gather in groups of dozens or hundreds and go into Palestinian villages and just start shooting and burning things. They start burning cars, they start uh, burning crops, uh, burning olive trees. And uh, so one of the famous ones that happened last year's uh, village called Hawara near Nablus, H-U-W-A-R-A, and uh, you know, an Israeli minister went up and said, "We need to erase this village off of the map." Um, and it's it, and the reason they need to erase it is that it comes in a strategic position between settlements, so they really want to get rid of it. So the settlers are always harassing it, and then, of course, any time any Palestinian does anything in return, it's used as an excuse for more and more escalation. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things. Well, this is this is an important point for the kind of a propaganda perspective that people have on what is going on in Palestine. There's always this. Um, asymmetry in that any kind of Israeli violence is justified. It's mm -hmm. okay. If the settlers did this, if the settlers did that, you know, for your average propaganda consuming moron in uh, the West, there is absolutely nothing that is unjustifiable. Uh, well, the Israelis did this, they must have had a good reason for it. Mm -hmm. And then absolutely no violence by the Palestinians is justified. There is nothing that you can do as a Palestinian. It doesn't matter if you have people robbing your house, burning your trees, taking your home. If you uh, slap somebody, then it's unjustified and you deserve whatever you have coming for like you. Like this a, is really this a apartheid or something. Absolutely. And it's just, it's, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely demoralizing to see how it is. And this is why, you know, before the whole Gaza thing, I never really spoke much about this because it's pointless. Um, there is just so much propaganda and so much bullshit that mm. talking to Americans and Europeans about it is is ridiculous. And, and, and I, I, words cannot uh, do justice to the extent of contempt that I have for the average American's uh, understanding of the conflict because it's so ridiculous, so immoral, so ignorant, and deeply, deeply criminal in the way mm. that they uh, approach it. And it's just, this is why I, I prefer to, <laughs> this is why for me, you know, uh, confronting the brainwashing on things like central banking and climate change yeah. and all of that stuff is it's like a walk in the park compared to this like <laughs> yeah why why are you so aggressive in the, uh, telling people that what they believe is bullshit well i'm not if i wanted to really confront people's ideas i'd be <laughs> talking to them about the middle east but i'm, I'm going to stick to the simple things like you know the medical scam and the central banking scam and the climate change scam <laughs> you got to pick your battles i guess i you know I've gone round and round on this topic with a number of people, uh, my girlfriend included, because there is this, I share that, right? I'm like, okay, I, as someone, by the way, that's, I'm not calling someone else out. I'm actually calling myself out. Like I, I didn't study this history. I didn't know a lot about this until these recent events have sort of pulled me into it. Um, it's very easy to just accept and regurgitate and propagate the mainstream media narrative that you are fed, right? It's very easy to not critically think. It's actually the easiest thing to do is you just, you know, propagate the message and, and move on. But uh, clearly that that leaves you with a very unsophisticated, untruthful view of, of what's going on. And uh, the other thing that's real dangerous here is, man, the temptation to get sucked into identity politics like when you just start talking, even I posted earlier this your your podcast. I'm like, hey, I love this podcast. It reminded me of the importance of private property. I quoted Mises and Rand, you know, a couple of quotes about private property, and people are just on me, like, oh, you're anti-Semite. You're this. You're that. You're not looking at the other side. I'm like, I just posted a podcast talking about the history of Israel and Palestine and private property, and like people are trying to get it into this identity politics battle. I think there's a real danger there, right? Because it's, it once people get entrenched in their position, there's no rational dialogue, right? It's just like, this is my position and your position. And there's, I guess, to try and conditionalize this in the libertarian standpoint, like I, and I would imagine you agree, I don't condemn any murder or violence or violation of private property, right? This is the non-aggression principle. You, 
you shouldn't do that to anyone ever. Uh, however, if someone's doing that to you individually in the moment, you have the right to defend yourself, right? To resist such aggression. Um, those are two sides of the same coin as far as I can see it. But there's my question what I'm trying to get to here is what is the role of mainstream media then in its the way it describes these events, the participation in these events, you know, it's saying, I, I forgot the term you're using earlier, like, um, you know, the violence that anyone, any Palestinians do is bad, but then if any Israeli violence is good or okay, or they're using terms like transfer rather than forcefully, you know, move people out of their homes, they're using euphemisms like ethnic cleansing rather than referring to what it really is. What is the role of mainstream media in the labels that they use in inducing this us versus them mentality, getting people into identity politics and preventing us from having any actual rational dialogue about what's going on, right? Calling this for what it actually is. Yeah, I think the best way to think of this is that it's in terms of who sets the Overton window. And that's what the media does. And so one thing that you mentioned, which really uh, I, I notice all the time, which is that, look, you, you, you're a relatively very well-read person. You, you, you've read more books than the average American by far, I think. And like, I'm sure you'd agree, the things that I have presented right now, whether you agree with them or not, different from what the things we generally hear, right? So if you were growing up in the US, this is new for you. This is not something that is very common. And you get a lot more of the Israeli perspective on things. Now, it's absolutely startling for me that it's so common for me when I'm talking to people that are pro-Israel, they have this reflexive thing, which is, um, well, here's what I think. And I say something that they've never heard before and something that is absolutely startling for them. Like, how could you say this? Like, no, 1948, for instance, no, there was no ethnic cleansing. The Arab armies attacked and then um, they, the, 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 the one major lie they have there is that the Arab armies told the Palestinians to leave so that they could fight the Israelis and then they bring them back and then the Palestinians left and now Israel's under no obligation to bring them back. It's complete garbage. There's absolutely no evidence this has ever happened. But this is what the average American thinks. It's completely um, false, but this is what they think. And so I present them with this perspective, which they'd never heard before. And it is always, it's, it's remarkable how many times I get what you just said, which is, oh, you're being biased and you're not listening to the other perspective. And this is just mm -hmm. your viewpoint. And it's just, it, 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 this for me is a telltale sign of propaganda, brainwashing, and conditioning. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that happens with me with economics. So when I was at Columbia University, I was one of the very few people, or, or, or maybe the only person I knew at that time, who had even heard of the Austrians and read the Austrians. And when I try and make an argument to somebody from an Austrian perspective, you know, they wouldn't counter it. They wouldn't try to tell them, no, you're wrong because of this and this and that, because obviously they've never read any Austrians that they don't, no, they're not familiar with it. And so an excellent knee-jerk reaction is to always just say, oh no, you're biased and you're not considering the second, the other viewpoint and you're mm -hmm. just uh, looking at it from this perspective. For me, this is, this is self-defense and projection and it's just the conditioning of the brainwashed mind that mm -hmm. I, no matter how limited my viewpoint, even though my viewpoint is just made up from listening to idiotic media like CNN and the New York Times giving me their perspective on things, and you know, I've not studied this. I've never read a book by a Palestinian. I've never read a book by an anti-Zionist. But I happen to know the full scope of acceptable opinion. And because you are presenting me with something outside of my conditioning and brainwashing, then my knee-jerk reaction is to call you close-minded. Mm -hmm. And you are biased. And you're just reflecting this. And it's, it's amazing how many times this happens. And I always tell them, look, I'm 100% certain I've read more books by Zionists than you have read by Zionists, let alone you reading books by anti-Zionists. Like I've read Herzl's book. I've read the books that have been written by so many of Israel's leaders. I'm so familiar with the political viewpoint of the Israeli uh, society. I have everything from the most extreme right in Moshe Feiglin to the most extreme left in Peace Now or Shabbat Aloni. Like, I'm very familiar with their arguments. I'm very familiar with how they think. I've studied this stuff very closely over the years. I'm pretty 
and familiar with all of those arguments. I may be wrong. You can call me wrong. You can call me an idiot. You can insult me. I, I like. I would respect you a lot more if you just call me an idiot than if you would call me close-minded because I'm not close-minded. I'm more exposed to these ideas than you are. But it's just it's it's such a it's such a sign of how the brainwashing works that all of these people are just conditioned to view things from this perspective. And according to that perspective, look. Israel is just looking for peace and the Palestinians are always derailing peace and everything that the Palestinians do is unjustified and um, uh, inexcusable. Everything that Israel does is justified. And um, and of course, the way to get this and, and, and the foundation on which all of this flawed analysis is built always has to be missing out completely on the issue of property rights. Mm -hmm. If you miss out on the issue of property rights, then you can justify whatever you want. And this is what it comes down to because nowhere in the world is it acceptable for somebody to say, your property rights are not valid because m m somebody I identify with lived in this land thousands of years ago. I mean, this is completely unacceptable. So the Romans ruled Britain at a certain point in time. You don't just see Italians walk into Britain and say, we want to build a, Brit a Roman homeland here. Mm -hmm. The Vikings ruled Sweden at a certain point in time. The people in Sweden today don't call themselves Vikings. So you don't see people come in to Sweden and say, nope, we're going to kick the Swedes out and we're going to move in the Vikings. And you know, you might say, well, this is ridiculous because the Swedish people are Vikings. Well, but the Palestinian people are the Hebrews and they are the Canaanites. They are the original inhabitants. So it's it's very similar, actually. And, and that's why this idea that we could just decide who descends from who in order to allocate property rights is just insane and it's criminal. You know, the, the notion that we could determine property rights based on who was here first doesn't make any sense. Right. You've got legitimate property rights that are either through homesteading or through property acquisition. And this is the thing, in 1947, everybody accepted the system of property rights that existed in Palestine. Everybody was fine with it because the Zionist migrants to Palestine bought land under that property rights system. They accepted it. So they accepted the Palestinians' claim to individual plots of land. And they had absolutely no serious claim to say, well, I am descended from this family that lived on this plot of land 2,000 years ago, and your family stole it from me 2,000 years ago, and now I need to get it back. That There was absolutely right. none of that because nobody could trace their origin back to individual people back then and individual plots of land back then. And that's the also key, right? It needs to be traceable through individuals. Exactly. Right. And, and and the other thing is, I mean, what makes this even more absurd is that, look, well, since the Islamic conquest of Palestine in 637, Jews could live in Palestine. So all of the world's jewelry, all of the world's diaspora could go back to Palestine. There was nothing stopping them. And yet they chose to remain in Poland and Germany and uh, Egypt and the US and in all those places in the world for centuries where this was not an issue and this was not uh, uh, this was not something that motivated them. It was only in the 20th century that this became an issue. So you can't say, I claim this property because I lived there for 2000 years when you had the chance to go back and live there and buy that property. The notion that it just becomes, uh, well, now we've decided to organize it to political movement, so I'm sorry, all of your property rights are invalid. That's what it ultimately comes down to. And then once you begin with this idea that the property rights of Palestinians are illegitimate because I'm a brainwashed idiot and I listen to what TV tells me and TV propaganda tells me that the property rights of Palestinians are illegitimate, well, then you can justify anything. Then anything that the Palestinians do is unjustified and anything that the Israelis do is justified. So... Um, this is, you know, and, 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 and this would be the same anywhere. This is why this is not a unique conflict that is unique to Jews and Muslims and Palestinians and Israelis or whatever. This would be the same situation if you did it anywhere. As I said earlier, you know, if you go to Tennessee and you said, we're going to make Tennessee into a German homeland, mm -hmm. you're going to get the same thing. If you have this, this insane idea that, uh, the Germans or, you know, the French in Louisiana, I, I had a debate with Walter Block on my podcast and he's, uh, very, he, he claims to be a libertarian, except when he bring up Israel, where he believes that it's okay for the government to own 90% of the land. You know, he's famous to constantly being on about, we want to, he wants to privatize the roads, wants to privatize the oceans, wants to privatize space, wants to privatize everything except for the land of Palestine. He wants it to remain in the hands of a monopoly government agency. And I 
told him, well, look, Louisiana was established by the French, and there's about a 10% minority on Louisiana today that is French originally. Why don't we make Louisiana into a French homeland? They were there before you. You know, you came to Louisiana long after the French had set up Louisiana. So why don't we establish Louisiana as a French homeland? Now, just imagine the carnage that would ensue if the world's most powerful governments and the world's money printer were out there financing turning Louisiana into a French national homeland. Mm. And how would the non-Louisianans react? I mean, how would you react to people saying here, yeah, well, and, and it's not even thousands of years in that case, it's hundreds of years. Hundreds of years ago, this was all French land. This all belonged to the French crown. And you are not French. You are, say, uh, American Polish or American British or American uh, African American, and you don't belong in Louisiana. We're going to kick you all out. And then if you fight back, then, oh, no, you're a terrorist. And so now we get to kick you out more and we have more justification. And this is this is really the predicament of the Palestinian in that you know, some people say, well, why don't the Palestinians just accept that the Israelis are stronger? All right. And then what do we do? You, like there is, that there's no solution where you can just coexist with this project because the right. project wants you out. They want you out. And in fact, a majority of Palestinians are out of Palestine. A lot of us have left and they become citizens of Jordan and they become refugees in Lebanon and in Syria and in Egypt. And they've many of them have moved on and become citizens of places like the US and Canada and Europe and so on. So a majority probably has already done that. But then what do you do with the rest? I mean, it's not easy for people to just up and leave their life and migrate. Right. And that's you know the, the question that the Zionists so the, the, they they always tell you well you're not being open minded and you're not considering and you're not being biased. I always like to ask them well what would you do if you were born a Palestinian? What would you do? Like would you just leave? Would you just give up? Would you take all of your family, all your friends, all of your relatives, and try and go somewhere else, and you know just uproot yourself from your community or take your entire community and go somewhere else and how would you um how would you justify that why do you think it's okay for you to just get kicked out of your home oh, that's a great great point a very difficult answer and th th this is another thing i've gone round and round about in my thinking and in conversations with others this idea of the brainwashing and the propagandizing and i guess i want to before i ask this I discovered this Chinese proverb recently that I really like because when we get into this, these historical messes of human history, um, it's difficult to know where to assign responsibility and blame, right? And I think as, as Bitcoiners, we often look to the incentive structure as, as being a solution. But this, this Chinese proverb says something like, he who blames others has a long way to go. He who blames himself is halfway there. He who blames nobody has arrived, something like that. So it's so easy, again, kind of back to the identity politics thing, to go into whatever your position is and say, oh, we're right, you're wrong, whoever it may be. But that doesn't really resolve anything. It doesn't, it just sort of perpetuates the conflict. So when you're talking about this brainwashing, brainwasher dynamic, this, the average American that's just regurgitating whatever he saw on mainstream media. Do we assign blame to the brainwashed or is it the brainwasher? Is it the guy doing the, the brainwashing or the brainwashy, I guess? And uh, again, with the, the condition of, I don't know if blame is even the right, the right word. And then going a layer deeper into the incentives, this is where I think printing money is almost like a mind control in a way. If you have someone that can just print money and buy mainstream media and manufacture these false narratives that they're implanting into people's fucking heads, like it's the closest thing I know of to mind control in the world. So um, I don't know. I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. If it's even worth trying to place responsibility on the brainwasher or brainwashy and then the role of money printing and just facilitating the whole thing. Yeah, I mean... I, uh, I, I generally don't like to be a person who um, assigns blame. In my own kind of personal life, in most other things, I've learned to just uh, accept the world as it is and try and make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I guess 
being a Palestinian is really like doing life on hard mode. And then once you've mm. been able to come to terms with that, then you can come to terms with pretty much everything else because everything else becomes a lot easier. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, in a sense, I, I, I've arrived at this, what you say, you know, the issue of just don't blame others, focus on yourself. And, mm-hmm. uh, just, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm much more of the, in the, in the camp of blame yourself. Like in, in anything in my life, I'm always looking at what is it that I could have done to make mm-hmm. things different. And so anything bad that happens to me, I'm the kind of person who sits down and, um, tries to really get to the bottom of what it is that I did that made this happen to me. In other words, even even when somebody does something wrong to you, um, it was your problem. It was your fault for trusting them, for letting them uh, do it, or being in a position where you had to do it. In this case, I mean, I, I was born in 1980. Uh, the die was cast by then. There was nothing I could do. Um, so it's pointless for me to sit and uh, blame myself about what, uh, how, wh- where I was born. And it's, um, also it's counterproductive as I always think it's counterproductive for me to go around to pointing fingers and blame. I'd rather think about how to move forward. And, mm-hmm. um, historically, the way that I thought about it is I, I've always thought that the idea that you could unscramble this egg of the two populations is completely uh, un- unworkable. So if you look at the map right now, there are uh, there are about seven and a half million Jews in Palestine and there are about seven and a half million non-Jews in Palestine. And uh, so there's about 2.2 million Palestinians in Israel who have Israeli citizenship. These are one in, in the land in which became Israel in 1948. They expelled about 90% of the population, 10% remained, and that 10% is today something like um, 20% of Israel's population, about 2.2 million. And then you have about uh, 2 million, 2.2 million also in Gaza. And then you have about 3 million or so in the West Bank. So that adds up to about seven, seven and a half million uh, Palestinians. And you also have seven and a half million Jews. This is roughly uh, the, the latest census data that I've looked at. It's roughly equal. And there's no clear way of separating them. And this has been always the case since the 1940s. You know, that study that I showed you earlier that was looking at the land and in that study by the United Nations, they say there is no easy way of separating the two populations. So there, in each city, there are Palestinians uh, in Israel uh, today and in the West Bank, the settlements and the Palestinian villages are so close to each other. So the notion that you could have two separate nation states is completely unworkable. And I think um, that's really the uh, sad reality that, you know, a lot of people like to virtue signal by saying, well, the Palestinians should have a second uh, two state and uh, this should be a two state solution. And then, of course, usually it's used as a way to blame the Palestinians. But in this case, it really is unworkable and it's, it, it can't be done that you cannot have two states there. And to the extent that you can have anything for the Palestinians, it's effectively a... Um, uh, a client regime of the Israelis, which is the situation right now with the Palestinian Authority, which gets its money. I mean, the, the Israelis collect the taxes um, and, and they give the taxes to the Palestinian Authority. They control what weapons they have. They control what they can do. There is no sense of the Palestinian Authority being an adversary of Israel. They don't fight the Israelis. And so this is, this is I think, the sad reality. There's only going, there's only room for one government in there, and ideally you want to have no governments. Of course, if you ask me, that the best solution is a no state solution. Mm-hmm. A second best solution would be a one state solution, and this is what we effectively have. We do have a one state solution, but the question is, what kind of one state is it going to be? Is it going to be a one state in which everybody has property rights and everybody has the right to own property and to have full civil rights, or is it going to be an apartheid system? And unfortunately, the answer is that it is an apartheid system. Mm-hmm. One of the Israel's, one of the Israeli government ministers, his name is um, Itamar Ben Gvir. Uh, recently, e- even before this, uh, before this October war started in Gaza, before that, uh, and and this, you know, the, the Israeli extremism was not born on October seventh. But this is, um, and and then when the, then it was in discussion of what was happening in the West Bank with all of these uh, settlers and uh, the problems that happened between settlers and the Palestinians. 
And so um, there was a, he was he was obviously encouraging the settlers to go and commit more acts of violence and to conquer more land and to build more settlements. And he said openly on TV, he said, it, "Look, Arabs need to understand they have only three options in this land: they can die, they can leave, or they can live subjugated to the Israelis' will. It is more important for me and my family to be able to drive around the West Bank safely than it is." or Arabs to live in the West Bank. So they need to choose one of these three options. And I think this is the sad reality of where we are right now. This is it. I mean, what Gaza has given the Israeli government is the carte blanche and on all the atrocity propaganda that they did of how um, horrible things are and all the... And, and, and I mean, if you remember the COVID era when people just were gripped by hysteria at the beginning of COVID, it was a very similar experience. So March 2020 was very similar to October 2023 in that you had these videos from China of people dropping dead because of the virus. And you had all these studies from the World Health Organization saying, well, the R0 is three or whatever, and then we're all going to die. And it's a seven sigma mm -hmm. uh, pandemic. And all of these people were freaking out. All of the kind of, you know, all, all of the people who think uh, reading the New York Times makes them experts on science. They were all freaking out. And similarly, this is the same demographic that thinks reading the New York Times makes them an expert on the Middle East. Mm. They all were freaking out and morally outraged about what happened in October. And in both cases, you know, whenever you see people afraid, you 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 should be worried mm. not about what they're afraid of. You should be worried about what they're going to be do out of their be doing out right. of their fear. So in the case of COVID, you know, the the response to COVID was far more devastating than COVID itself, whether it was through the ventilators that killed so many people, whether it was through the suppression of the drugs in order to sell the other drugs, whether it was through the other drugs that have killed so many people, mm -hmm. whether it was through the lockdowns and all of the destruction that that brought about and all the economic destruction, it ended up being far more destructive and dangerous than the virus itself. And similarly here, you know, the horror that has been unleashed on the Palestinians since October 7, whether it's in the West Bank or Gaza has been unlike anything that we've ever seen before. And it's just the carte blanche for them to kill as many as possible, drive out as many as possible. And I think this is where we're going now that it's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very pessimistic about it because I think it's just going to be uh, more of this. And uh, I don't see any realistic way in which this is going to be stopped. I don't see any force that's going to try and stop this. So we're going to be heading toward maybe more transfer, more, uh, um, murder and so therefore the the goal for the Israelis now is to try and tip the demographic balance to reduce the number of Palestinians and subjugate them more and more um bitter bitter pill to swallow for sure um and the the point on fear I think very well taken the I think this is deeply related to fiat actually like if you think about Obviously, the person that is accepting a something by decree, right? You're you're accepting something under the threat, veiled threat of force. You're complying with that legislation by fiat or other. If it's money by fiat, you're complying with that out of fear in a way, right? And then also, the person imposing that fiat, I think, is operating out of kind of a fear paradigm, right? They're trying to impose something on you so they can gain something for themselves because they're scared of what otherwise might happen. So this is weird, I don't know, metaphysical relationship with fear and fiat that once you start engaging in it, it 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 makes people really crazy, it makes people do crazy things. And it, like you just went through the COVID example, which was, you know, spot on. Um, okay. Bit of a dark turn there is, <laughs> I know you did this at the end of your podcast. I told you that I was listening to 198. We always say Bitcoin fixes this. Well, what, if anything, can Bitcoin do to help this situation? And if it's not help this specific situation, just due to timing, does Bitcoin do anything to help prevent this act of apartheid or colonialism or whatever we're calling this from happening in the future? Does it, does it help prevent it or mitigate it in the future? I mean, the, uh, this is, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's why we Bitcoin really like, um, understanding how money is 
at the root of all of the problems in the world. And, and you've done a terrific job of doing this and illustrating this on your podcast. A lot of people like to uh, mock us Bitcoiners for this, but I think it's it's it, it's a horrific uh, own goal for them when they do this because they only expose the, the enormous amount of brainwashing and ignorance ignorance that they have when they try and argue that money is not related to everything in the world when mm. money is related to everything in the world everything is um everything economic is done through money and everything in your life is affected by economic decisions and so i think uh you know we've discussed how money affects time preference how money affects your life choices how money affects government intervention and all kinds of things so i believe that money does uh, play a role I was a lot more optimistic about Bitcoin fixes this until the last few months, I'll be honest. And the way that I would suggest that it would fix something like this is that ultimately, I think, um, yeah, the, as we started earlier, that there's nothing that means, that there's nothing that predetermines that uh, Muslims and Jews and Christians can't live in Palestine. It has been done for 1400 years before it can be done, well, 1300 years, and it can be done again. And uh, Muslims, Jews, and Christians live together and coexist in places like the U.S. and in all over the world, as long as they are able to have the right to property. And if everybody has the right to property, then they are able to coexist. Mm -hmm. So for all of the drama about identity politics in the U.S., and yes, there's a lot of drama around it, at the end of the day, you walk out of your house, you go to the best restaurant that you can get, or the best supermarket, or the best shopping mall, and you don't care if the owner is Muslim or Christian or Jewish or white or black. When property rights are there, you're out there looking out for yourself. You care about getting the best food, the best clothes, the best things. And, 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 and that just incentivizes you and everybody else to work and cooperate with one another rather than be in conflict. So I think what has been a very unfortunate thing about the conflict over the past century is the fact that... Um, people who are not living there are able to influence it over uh, uh, long distances from abroad because of fiat. In other words, um, just because the American government is out there handing out billions of dollars in military aid and other kinds of aid to the US government, to the Israeli government, and that's been the case since the inception of Israel, Israel has gotten hundreds of billions of dollars from the US you know, they just got $14 billion a few months ago. They have unlimited weapons. The U.S. moved its um, aircraft carriers to the coast near Gaza, and they were almost certainly involved in operations, at least in, um, uh, in, in providing the weaponry and the equipment for the Israelis for this operation. I think this is, um, uh, I mean, if you believe that fiat money is a problem, if you believe in the concept of property rights, if you believe in libertarian ideas, you cannot but see this as being a bad thing. No matter how much of a pro-Israel person you are, you've got to admit, uh, if you have any sense of morality, any sense of uh, decency, you've got to admit that devaluing the wealth of dollar holders in the US and the rest of the world in order to finance this holy war that uh, Israeli fundamentalists are waging against a defenseless population is wrong. It's, uh, you know, if you want to fight that war, go and give them your own money, but mm -hmm. you don't have to uh, take everybody else's wealth. And I think beyond just the fact that it is immoral, you know, immorality is not just, uh, it's, it's not just morality, it's not just a morality play where we uh, score points by saying this is moral. Like there are real consequences to things being done wrong. There are real consequences to wrong things taking place. And in this case, the fact is that the, the most belligerent, most um, aggressive and least uh, peaceful elements of um, Zionism are the ones that are uh, strengthened by this endless checkbook of the United States, which is only possible because of fiat money. Mm -hmm. So we would we we've always had a very strong current of Zionism that was um, well always until recently I would say that was always much more. Um, willing to compromise with the local Palestinians. Initially, Zionism for a lot of the first immigrants, it was a cultural movement, it was a uh, it was a religious movement, and there was an idea that we were going to go to Palestine and we're going to cooperate with the local population, we're not going to kick them out and they're not gonna kick us out, and that it was going to be something that was 
um, beneficial for everybody involved. But fiat for me is what prevents that from happening. In other words, without the infinite money printer, these elements within Israeli society and the similar elements within Palestinian society would come to terms and we would be able to coexist and you'd have a system of property rights respect for everybody. But then you give somebody a money printer and then you destroy all the chances of coexistence, all the chances of well, why would I compromise? Well, I've got a money printer, I get infinite mm-hmm. money, infinite weapons. So that strengthens the most extreme elements within Israeli society. That allows for the subsidy of uh, settlements on Palestinian land. It allows for continuous dispossession of Palestinians, transfer of Palestinians, murder of Palestinians. And that, of course, in turn, leads to the development of similar and um, reactionary um, rejectionist elements and extreme elements within the Palestinian society. And so, of course, this is extremely difficult for most pro-Israel people to do because they're very conditioned to never think of Palestinians as human beings. But really, put yourself in the shoes of a Palestinian and think of where you would be, what kind of political arrangement you would support. And you'll see that you would be heading more and more and more extreme the more and more uh, extreme the Zionists are. So this for me is is the dangerous thing here, and this is the dangerous dynamic that the the money printer is what allows for the indulgence of the worst uh, impulses of both parties, mm-hmm. and it creates uh, more and more problems for everybody, and it makes this more and more um, in tra- makes everybody more intransigent. And I believe if it wasn't for that, I think European Jewish migration to Palestine could have been absorbed, could have been mm-hmm. part of the country. Could have been it could have happened naturally and normally and it would have been absolutely um doable and, it, and we could have had a society that was um th- that had people from different ethnicities as long as we have property rights i think well yeah. it's not voluntary when you destroy all the infrastructure when you deliberately target all the infrastructure and the whole the notion that they're targeting hamas in my mind is completely belied by facts they've been targeting every form of infrastructure every hospital all of the electricity, all of the uh, running water, all the sewage system, they want to make that land unlivable and they want to drive the population out. And this is what they're doing. And I mean, this has been the case from day one. They said, we want to turn Gaza into a city of tents so that it is unlivable, so that everybody leaves. And I think, um, you know, they, they, they've already murdered probably at least 30,000 people that we know of. There's probably more in the rubble. And uh, they've maimed so many and they're already we're seeing diseases beginning to spread already and i think that's going to continue to exacerbate and they, they they're deliberately doing this and it's going to become make it even more and more unlivable and that's going to drive more and more people out and so um i think this this was the plan for all along and i think um um it's just a continuation of the worst elements within the zionist idea which is more and, and this has been the motto from day one more land, fewer Arabs. That's it. Then we need to get as much land as possible and have as few Arabs as possible. And we need to do everything we can, whether it's through murder, housing demolitions, aerial bombardment, um, restrictions on movement, land confiscation, all these things. They just lead toward one thing, more land in the hand of the Israeli government and fewer Arabs on that land. It's it's very dark. It's very bleak. I don't know if it can be... Uh, fixed in any way um i yeah d- don't even know what to say honestly i just the lens of private property is just only right way to see it as far as i can tell right this this whole idea that you're saying that we the most extreme elements in individuals or societies are basically getting amplified right through fiat, right? As people get more desperate, there's more stealing, there's more lying, there's more theft, there's more violence. And it's this whole, like, it creates this whole, I don't know, a metaphysical rift or something. And uh, because what? We're removing opportunity costs that would otherwise force people to the negotiation negotiation table to, like, actually come to some type of peace deal or some armistice, ceasefire or something, some form of peace. That gets removed when you can just print money and um, it's like the violation of private property by inflation just begets more violation of private property by tax, war, conquest, et cetera. Um, almost like an addiction or putting fuel on the fire or something like that. And, uh, 
yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just horrible. So I, I don't know that Bitcoin fixes this particular episode of it, but maybe in the future, if we're on a Bitcoin standard, we would presumably see less of this. Is that, is there some type of bright orange hope we can have for a future where we don't have to see so much of this recurring in, in human nature and human history? I hope so. I mean, I think uh, once you've got property rights established in Bitcoin, I think, um, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, uh, Pierre Rochard said it, uh, Bitcoin is going to bring peace to the Middle East because land is a shitcoin. And I think <laughs> there's some truth to that. And that um, you know, land is a great way to store wealth over time because wealth is usually um, easy to devalue and land is not very easy to take away. It's easier to defend generally. It's, uh, and so you can see the attachment that comes from land. And so in a world in which money is a shitcoin, as I always say, when your money is a shitcoin, everything becomes a shitcoin. So people start over investing in all kinds of things they don't need because they don't have any money. But once you have a money that you can store your wealth in, and that's e easy to secure, difficult to steal, mm. then you start requiring a lot less shit coins in your life. So you start, you know, you don't need government bonds, you don't need gold, and you don't need as much um, emotional attachment to land anymore. You know, you obviously you need land, you need to exist mm -hmm. somewhere, but uh, this notion of land being um, the your life fixating around land, I think it becomes more and more undermined. So I think taking away the money printer, which is what Bitcoin does on the one hand, takes away the financing of the most belligerent elements and takes away the incentive for people to get so emotionally attached to uh, land and collective notions of land. And then having secure property rights increases the likelihood of wanting to cooperate with others and wanting to trade with others and not caring about what religion or what belief they have that i guess would be the, the the hopeful message that you could try and deduce from some something like this although it almost feels cruel to be discussing this honestly um mm. to, i mean it's 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 embarrassing to be saying this to palestinians now in gaza that no um, you know just hold on bitcoin's going to come and fix this yeah it's it's it, it, it's on it's, it's a cruel joke to be saying this unfortunately yeah my area um well safety and i appreciate you coming on to talk about this i know it's not exactly a fun conversation but obviously very important and um thank you for the work that you've done and continue to do to try and shine some light on this um I, is there anything, uh, any action steps, anything we can leave people with is like, hey, go and do this to try and nudge the universe in the right direction. Like, is it just education? Uh, like, what else can people do? I mean, I think, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me and like for really doing your research on this and allowing this to be such a, um, I feel it was a very good conversation where I managed to organize my thoughts on this. And it's probably going to help me um, write out these things into something. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, in terms of what people can do, I think you know if you're uh, if you, if you're an American or European, you are. I mean, look, I, I I completely respect the fact that a lot of people just don't want to be involved and want and want to be ignorant. And I I don't mind people just saying, look, there are a lot of conflicts in the world, and I don't know enough about them, and I don't know enough to get involved. And I respect that, and I am like that. I don't talk about uh, most conflicts in the world, and I barely, I don't think I've ever said anything in public about the Russian-Ukrainian conflict because I don't feel like I know enough about it to be giving strong opinions. Um, and so I, I could totally understand that. I think, um, so if, if that's your perspective, um, then I understand, and although even that, you might argue, is not really very satisfactory because it is your government that is out there that is uh, making this happen. So, um, you know, obviously there are a lot of bad things that your government does, but I think you should probably have some knowledge of why this is a bad thing and why they're making it worse. And I think, um, you know, it, it sucks to be saying in this because generally I'm always very skeptical and cynical about political processes, but... Um, your congressman is out there being a complete prostitute for the Israeli government. And 
they're out there signing off on giving them all of that money. They're out there virtue signaling about, you know, opposing genocide and never again and so on and all that stuff. And yet when there's an actual genocide and a mass murder and an actual government saying, we want to get rid of this population of 2 million people and kick them out and take over their land, your congressman is signing off on it. So, um, I mean, if, if, if any of this moves you enough to want to do something, I think calling your congressman and telling him um, or not voting for him next time, that might be something. And trying to join uh, forms of activism that try and raise awareness of this, I think, is, is, is very important. I think, I, think I, I, I understand why most Americans in particular would rather stay away from this because it's, it's a highly charged thing and there's a very effective form of propaganda, which is anytime you say, well, I don't think it's a nice thing to be bombing 2 million people and telling them they should leave and go out of their homes, then you're immediately getting called an anti-Semite and you're immediately getting uh, hard with all of these emotionally charged words that nobody wants to be associated with. So it's, it's, it's a very similar thing with, you know, with, with everything. So if you're, if, if you mention anything about not liking uh, pharmaceutical companies, you're an anti-vaxxer, you're anti-science. If you don't like climate change hysteria, you don't believe we should just shut off all of the world's critical energy infrastructure overnight because it'll fix the weather, then you're anti-science. And similarly, if you think that we shouldn't be handing over infinite amounts of money to a government of extremists who believe they have a God-given right to kill and expel and subjugate, as they themselves put it, a population, then somehow that makes you <laughs> that makes you racist against them. It's just so ridiculous. So I can sort of understand why you would want to stay away from this and not get involved, but I can also really appreciate it when somebody decides to stick their neck out and speak out. And that's why I, I really admire you for having me on, Robert, and taking the time to look at this. And I think, you know, if more people, I, I realize, I think with what's happening now, I think I would say a majority probably of people are leaning toward this perspective, uh, particularly among younger generation, people who grew up on the internet rather than CNN and New York Times, they're seeing this and it's it's clearly wrong. But I think the silent majority, the majority is silent because um, it's way too much headache. Um, a lot of people are speaking up. I think a lot more could be speaking up. And I think if uh, a significant uh, change happens in the um, discourse on this, I think we might see change in uh, the policies. Yeah, I think... I forget who said it, but something like the the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who remain neutral during a moral crisis. So, um, yeah, I hope people. I hope this helps wake some people up and gets people to take whatever action they can. Um, thank you again for doing this. Uh, this was a long one, but really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Hopefully, we'll do another one on uh, less uh, morbid and less uh, disturbing topics at some point. Yes, you'll be, will you be in uh, July 2024 in Nashville? Were you coming in for that one? I don't think so. No, unfortunately, okay. I won't make it. Well, well, next time you're here, we'll do one in person and hopefully on a lighter topic. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank Cheers. Thanks. Sir.